This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson. The Cosmic Computer by H. Beam Piper. Chapter 13 The ship lurched slightly. In the outside screens, the lights around, the crowd that was waving goodbye, and the floor of the crater began receding. The sound pickups were full of cheering, and the boom of a big gun at one of the top batteries, and the amplified music of a band playing the traditional spaceman's hymn. "'It's been a long time since I heard that played in earnest,' Jackmont said. "'Well, we're off to see the wizard.' The lights dwindled and merged into a tiny circle in the darkness of the crater. The music died away, the cannon shots became a faint throbbing. Finally there was silence, and only the stars above and the dark land and the starlit sea below. After a long while a sunset glow, six hours passed on Barathrum, appeared in the west, behind the now appreciable curvature of the planet. "'Stand by for shift to vertical,' Captain Nichols called, his voice echoing from P.A. outlets throughout the ship. "'Ready for shift, Captain Nichols,' Jackmont reported from the duplicate control panel. Khan went to the after bulkhead, leaning his back against it. "'Ready here, Captain,' he said. Other voices took it up. Lights winked on the control panels. "'Shifting over,' Nichols said. Your ship now, Captain Jackmont. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. The deck began to tilt, and then he was lying on his back, his feet against the side of the control room, which had altered its shape and dimensions. There was a jar as the drive went on, in line with the new direction of the lift, and the ship began accelerating. He got to his feet, and he and Charlie Gatworth went to the astrogational computer, and began checking the data and setting the course for the point in space at which Koshai would be in a hundred and sixty hours. "'Course set, Captain,' he reported to Jackmont, after a while. A couple of lights winked on the control panel. There was nothing more to do but watch Poitem dwindle behind, and listen to newscasts, and take turns talking to friends on the planet." They approached the halfway point. The acceleration rate decreased, and the gravity indicator dropped, little by little. Everybody was enjoying the new sense of lightness, romping and skylarking like newly landed tourists on Luna. It was fun, as long as they landed on their feet at each jump, and the food and liquid stayed on plates and in glasses and cups. Eve's Jackmont began posting signs in conspicuous places. Weight is what you lift. Mass is what hurts when it hits you. Weight depends on gravity. Mass is always constant. His father came on screen from his office in Storsenda. By then there was a thirty-second time lag in communication between the ship and Poitem. My private detectives found out about the Andromeda, he said. She is going to Penurge, in the Gamma system. They have a couple of computer men with them, one they hired from the stock exchange, and one they practically shanghaied away from the government. And some of the people who chartered the ship are members of a family that were interested in a positronic equipment plant on Penurge at the time of the war. That's all right, then. We don't need to worry about that any more. They're just hunting for Merlin. Some of his companions were looking at him curiously. A little later, Piet Ludwigsen, the electromagnetics engineer, said, I thought you were looking for Merlin, Khan. Not on Koshai. We're looking for something to build a hypership out of. 
If I had Merlin in my hip pocket right now, I'd trade it for one good ship like the city of Asgard, or the city of Nefertiti, and give it a keg of brandy and a box of cigars to boot. If we had a ship of our own, we'd be selling lots of both, and not for store send us spaceport prices either. But don't you think Merlin's important? Charlie Gatworth, who had overheard him, asked. Sure. If we find Merlin, we can run it for president. It would make a better one than Jake Vykoven. He let it go at that. Plenty of opportunities later to expand the theme. The gravitation gauge dropped to zero. Now they were in free fall, and it lasted twice as long as Eve's Jackmont had predicted. There were a few misadventures, none serious, and most of them comic. For example, when Jerry Revis opened a bottle of beer, everybody was chasing the amber globules and catching them in cups, and those who were splashed were glad it hadn't been hot coffee. They made their second 180-degree turnover while weightless. Then they began decelerating and approached Koshai stern on and the gravity gauge began climbing slowly up again, and things began staying put, and they were walking instead of floating. Koshai grew larger and larger ahead. The polar ice caps, and the faint dappling of clouds, and the dark wiggling lines on the otherwise uniform red-brown surface, which were mountain ranges, became visible. Finally they began to see, first with the telescopic screens, and then, without magnification, the little dots and specks that were cities and industrial centers. Then they were in the atmosphere, and Jackmont made the final shift to horizontal position and turned the ship over to Nichols. For a moment, the scout boat tumbled away and the ship and Khan were back in free fall. Then he got on the lift and drive and steadied it, and pressed the trigger button firing a green smoke bomb. Beside him, Eve's Jackmont put on the radio and screen pickups. He could see the ship circling far above, and the manipulator boat, with its claw arms and grapples, breaking away from it. Then he looked down on the endless desert of iron oxide that stretched in all directions to the horizon, until he saw a spot, optically the size of a five centisol piece, that was the shipbuilding city of Port Carpenter. He turned the boat toward it, firing four more green smokes at three second intervals. The manipulator boat started to follow, and the Harriet Barn, now a distant speck in the sky, began coming closer. Below, as he cut speed and altitude, he could see the pockmarks of open pit mines and the glint of sunlight on bright metal and armor glass roofs the blunt conical stacks of nuclear furnaces, and the twisted slag flows, like the ancient lava flows of Barathrum. And, he reflected, he was an influential non-office-holding stockholder in every bit of it, as soon as they could screen Storsenda and get claims filed. A high tower rose out of the middle of Port Carpenter, with a glass-domed mushroom top. That would be the telecast station, the administrative buildings were directly below it and around its base. He came in slowly over the city, above a spaceport with its empty landing pits in a double circle around a traffic control building, and airship docks and warehouses beyond. More steel mills, factories, either hemispherical domes or long buildings with rounded tops. Ship construction yards and docks, for the most part, these were empty but on some of them the landing stands of spaceships, like eight- and ten-legged spiders, waited for forty years for hulls to be built on them. A few spherical skeletons of ships. A few with some of the outer skin on. It wasn't until he was passing close to them that he realized how huge they were. And stacks of material, sheet steel, deck plate, girders, and contragravity lifters and construction machines, all left on jobs that were never finished, the bright, rustless metal dulled by forty years of rain and wind-blown red dust. 
they must have been working here right to the very last, and then, when the evacuation elsewhere was completed, they had dropped whatever they were doing, piled into such ships as were completed, and lifted away. The mushroom-topped tower rose from the middle of a circular building piled level on level, almost half a mile across. He circled over it, saw an airship dock, and called the Harriet Barn while Jackmont talked to Jerry Rebus, piloting the manipulator boat. Rebus came in and joined them in the air. They hovered over the dock and helped the ship down when she came in, nudging her into place. By the time Kahn and Jackmont and Rebus and Anse Dawes and Rodell and Yutsko and Karanja were out on the dock in oxygen helmets, the ship's airlock was opening and Nichols and Vibart and the others were coming out, towing a couple of small lifters loaded with equipment. The airlock door into the building, at the end of the dock, was closed. When somebody pulled the handle, it refused to open. That meant it was powered from the central power unit, wherever that was. There was a plug socket beside it, and the required voltage marked over it. They used an extension line from a power unit on one of the lifters to get it open, and did the same with the inner door. When it was open, they passed into a dim room that stretched away ahead of them and on either side. It looked like a freight shipping room. There were a few piles of boxes and cases here and there, and a litter of packing material everywhere. A long counter desk and a bank of robo-clerks behind it. According to the air analyzer, the oxygen content inside was safely high. They all pulled off their fishbowl helmets and slung them. "'Well, we can bunk inside here tonight,' somebody said. "'It won't be so crowded here.' "'We'll bunk here after we find the power plant and get the ventilator fans going,' Jackmont said. Anse Dawes held up the cigarette he had lighted. That was all the air analyzer he needed. "'That looks like enough oxygen,' he said. "'Yes, it makes its own ventilation, convection,' Jackmont said. "'But you go to sleep in here, and you'll smother in a big puddle of your own exhaled CO2. Just watch what the smoke from that cigarette's doing.' The smoke was hanging motionless a few inches from the hot ash on the end of the cigarette. "'We'll have to find the power plant, then,' Matsui, the power engineer, said. "'Down at the bottom and in the middle, I suppose, and anybody's guess how deep this place goes.' "'We'll find plans of the building,' Jerry Rebus said. "'Any big dig I've ever been on, you could always find plans. "'The troubleshooters always had them.' security officer, and maintenance engineer. There were inside-use vehicles in the big room. They loaded what they had with them onto a couple of freight skids and piled on, starting down a passage toward the center of the building. The passageways were well marked with direction signs, and they found the administrative area at the top and center around the base of the telecast tower. The security offices from which police, military guard, fire protection, and other emergency services were handled, had a fine set of plans and maps, not only for the building itself, but for everything else in Port Carpenter. The power plant, as Matsui had surmised, was at the very bottom, directly below. The only trouble, after they found it, was that it was completely dead. The reactors wouldn't react, the converters wouldn't convert, and no matter how many switches they shoved in, there was no power output. The inside telemeter equipment, of course, was self-powered. Some of them were dead, too, but from those which still worked, Mohammed Matsui got a uniformly disheartening story. "'You know what happened?' he said. "'When this gang bugged out, back in 854, they left the power on. Now the conversion mass is all gone.' and the plutonium's all spent. We'll have to find more plutonium, and tear this whole thing down and refuel it, and repack the mass conversion chambers, provided nothing's eaten holes in itself, after the mass inside was all converted. How long will it take? Kahn asked. 
If we can find plutonium, and if we can find robots to do the work inside, and if there's no structural damage, and if we keep it up, a couple of days. All right, let's get at it. I don't know where we'll find shipyards like these anywhere else, and if we do, things will probably be as bad there. We came here to fix things up and start them, didn't we? Chapter 14 It didn't take as long as Mohammed Matsui expected. They found the Fissionables magazine, and in it plenty of plutonium, each subcritical slug in a 500-pound collapsium canister. There were repair robots, and they only had to replace the cartridges in the power units of three of them. They sent them inside the collapsium-shielded, death-to-people area, transmitter robots to relay what the others picked up through receptors wire-connected with the outside, foreman robots, globes a yard in diameter covered with horns and spikes, like old-fashioned ocean navy mines, worker robots in a variety of shapes, but mostly looking like many clawed crabs. Neither the converter nor the reactor had sustained any damage while the fissionables were burning out. So the robots began tearing out reactor elements, and removing plutonium slugs no longer capable of sustaining chain reaction, but still dangerously radioactive. Nuclear reactors had become simple and easier to service since the first day of the year zero, when Enrico Fermi put the first one into operation, but the principles remained the same. Work was less backbreaking and muscle straining, but it called for intense concentration on screens and meters and buttons that was no less exhausting. The air around them began to grow foul. Finally, the air analyzer squawked and flashed red lights to signal that the oxygen had dropped below the safety margin. They had no mobile fan equipment or time to hunt any. They put on their fishbowl helmets and went back to work. After twelve hours, with a few short breaks, they had the reactors going. Jerry Rebus and a couple of others took a heavy-duty lifter and went looking for conversion mass. They brought back a couple of tons of scrap iron and fed it to the converters. A few seconds after it was in, the pilot lights began coming on all over the panels. They took two more hours to get the oxygen separator and the ventilator fans going and, for good measure, they started the water pumps and the heating system. Then they all went outside to the ship to sleep. The sun was just coming up. It was sunset when they rose and returned to the building. The airlocks opened at a touch on the operating handles. Inside the air was fresh and sweet. The temperature was a pleasantly uniform 75 degrees Fahrenheit. The fans were humming softly and there was running hot and cold water everywhere. Jerry Revis, Ants Dawes, and the three tramp freighter forecastle hands took lifters and equipment and went off foraging. The rest of them went to the communication center to get the telecast station, the radio beacon, and the inside screen system into operation. There were a good many things that had to be turned on manually, and more things that had been left on forty years ago and now had to be repowered or replaced. They worked at it most of the night. Before morning, almost everything was working, and they were sending a signal across twenty-eight million miles to Storsenda on Poitem. It was late evening, Storsenda time, but Rodney Maxwell, who must have been camping beside his own screen, came on at once, which is to say five and a half minutes later. "'Well, I see you got in somewhere.' Where are you, and how is everything?" Then he picked up a cigar out of an ashtray in front of him and lit it, waiting. "'Port Carpenter. We're in the main administration building,' Khan told him. He talked for a while about what they had found and done since their arrival. "'Have you an extra view screen fitted for recording?' he asked. Five and a half minutes later, his father nodded. "'Yes, right here.' He leaned forward and away from the communication screen in front of him. I have it on, he gave the wavelength combination. Ready to receive. This is about all we have now. 
views we took coming in from the ship and a scout boat. He started transmitting them. We haven't sent in any claims yet. I wasn't sure whether I should make them for Alpha Interplanetary or Litchfield Exploration and Salvage. Don't bother sending in anything to the claims office, his father said. Send anything you want to claim in here to me, and I'll have Sturber, Flynn, and Chen Wong file them. They'll be made for a new company we're organizing. What? Another one? His father nodded, grinning. Koshai Exploitation and Development. We've made application already. We can't claim exclusive rights to the whole planet, like the old interstellar exploration companies did before the war, but since you're the only people on the planet, we can come pretty close to it by detail. He was looking to one side at the other screen. Great goo, Khan! This place of yours altogether beats anything I ever dug. Force Command and Barathrum spaceport included. How big would you say it is? More than ten miles in radius? About five or six. Ten or twelve miles across. That's all right, then. We'll just claim the building you're in now and the usual ten-mile radius, the same as at Force Command. We'll claim the place as soon as the company's chartered. In the meantime, send in everything else you can get views of. They set up a regular radio and screen watch after that. Charlie Gatworth and Piet Ludwigsen, both of whom were studying astrogation in hopes of qualifying as space officers after they had a real spaceship, elected themselves to that duty. It gave them plenty of time for study. Jerry Rivas and Ance Dawes, with whomever they could find to help them, were making a systematic search. They looked, first of all, for foodstuffs, and found enough in the storerooms of three restaurants on the executive level to feed their own party in gourmet style for a year, and enough in the main storerooms to provision an army. They even found refrigerators and freeze bins full of meat and vegetables fresh after forty years. That surprised everybody for the power units had gone dead long ago. Then it was noticed that they were covered with collapsium. Anything that would stop cosmic rays was a hundred percent efficient as a heat insulator. Coming in the first day, Khan had seen an almost completed hypership bulking above the domes and roofs of Port Carpenter in the distance. He saw it again on screen from a pickup atop the central tower. As soon as the party was comfortably settled in the executive apartments on the upper levels, he and Eves Jackmont and Mac Vibart and Shock Retief, the construction engineer, found an air car in one of the hangars and went to have a closer look at her. She had all her collapsium on except for a hundred-foot circle at the top and a number of rectangular openings around the sides. Eves Jackmont said that that would be where the airlocks would go. They always put them on last. But don't be surprised at anything you find or don't find inside. As soon as the skeleton's up, they put the armor on, and then build the rest of the ship out from the middle. It might be slower getting material in through the airlock openings, but it holds things together while they're working. They put on the car's lights, lifted to the top, and let down through the upper opening. It was like entering a huge globular spider's web, globe within globe, of interlaced girders and struts and braces, extending from the center to the outer shell. Even the spider was home, a three-hundred-foot ball of collapsium, looking tiny at the very middle. "'Why, this isn't a ship!' Vibart cried in disgust. "'This is just the outside of a ship. They haven't done a thing inside!' Oh, yes, they have, Jack Mott contradicted, aiming a spotlight toward the shimmering ball in the middle. They have all the engines in. Abbott lift and drive, Dillingham hyperdrives, pseudograv, power reactors, converters, everything. They wouldn't have put on the shielding if they hadn't. They did that as soon as they had the outside armor on. Wonder why they didn't finish her if they got that far, Retief said. They didn't need her. They'd had it. They wanted to go home. Well, we're not going to finish her, 
not with any fifteen men, Retief said. One man has only two hands, two feet and one brain. He can only handle so much robo-equipment at a time. I never expected we'd build a ship ourselves, Khan said. We came to look the place over and get a few claims staked. When we've done that, we'll go back and get a real gang together. I don't know where you'll find them, Jack Mont commented. We'll need a couple of hundred, and they ought all to be graduate engineers. We can't do this job with farm tramps. You made some good shipyard men out of farm tramps on Barathrum. And what'll you do for supervisors? You're one. General Superintendent. Mac, you, and Shock are a couple of others. You just keep a day ahead of your men in learning the job, you'll do all right. Vibart turned to Jackmont. You know Eves, he'll do it, he said. He doesn't know how impossible this is, and when we try to tell him, he won't believe us. You can't stop a guy like that. All right, Khan, deal me in. I won't let anybody be any crazier than I am, Jack Mott declared, and then looked around the vastness of the empty ship with its lacework of steel. All you need is about ten million square feet of decks and bulkheads, an air and water system, hydroponic tanks and carniculture vats, astrogation and robo-pilot equipment, about which I know very little, a hyperspace pilot system, about which I know nothing at all. Khan, why don't you just build a new Merlin? It would be simpler. I don't want a new Merlin. I'm not even interested in the original Merlin. This is what I want, right here. He told his father, by screen, about the ship. I believe we can finish her, but not with the gang that's here. We'll need a couple of hundred men. Now, with the supplies we've found, we can stay here indefinitely. Should we do more exploring and claim some more of these places, or should we come home right away and start recruiting, and then come back with a large party, start work on the ship, and explore and make further claims as we have time, he asked. Better come back as soon as possible. Just explore Port Carpenter. Find out what's going to be needed to finish the ship, and what facilities you have to produce it, and get things cleaned up a little, so that you can start work as soon as you have people to do it. I'm organizing another company. Don't laugh now, I've only started promotioneering, which I think we will call Tri-System and Interstellar Space Lines. Get me all the views you can of the ship herself, and of the steel mills and that sort of thing that will produce material for finishing her. I want to use them in promotion. By the way, has she a name? Only a shipyard construction number. Then suppose you call her Ouroboros, after Genji Gartner's old ship, the one that discovered the tri-system. Ouroboros, too. That's fine. We'll do. Good. I'll have Sturber, Flynn, and Chen Wong make application for a charter right away. We'll have to make Alpha Interplanetary one of the stockholding companies, and also Koshai Exploitation and Development, and, of course, Litchfield Exploration and Salvage. It was a pity there really wasn't a Merlin. If this kept on, nothing else would be able to figure out who owned how much stock in what. They found the on-the-job engineering office for the ship in a small dome half a mile from the construction dock. Eves Jackmont and Mac Vibart and Shock Retief moved in and buried themselves to the ears in specifications and blueprints. The others formed into parties of three or four, and began looking about production facilities for material. There was a steel mill a mile from the construction site. It was almost fully robotic. Iron ore went in at one end, and finished sheet steel and girders and deck plates came out at the other. And a dozen men could handle the whole thing. There was a collapsium plant. There were machine shops and forging shops. Every time they finished inspecting one, Eves Jackmont would have a list of half a dozen more plants that he wanted found and examined yesterday morning at the latest. Some of them were in a frightful mess. Work had been suspended, and everybody had gone away, leaving everything as it was. Some were in perfect order, 
ready to go into operation again as soon as power was put on. It had depended, apparently, upon the personal character of whoever had been in charge in the end. The nuclear electric power unit plant was in the latter class. The man in charge of it evidently hadn't believed in leaving messes behind, even if he didn't expect to come back. It was built in the shape of a T. One side of the cross-stroke contained the cartridge case plant, where presses form sheet steel cylinders, some as small as a round of pistol ammunition, and some the size of ten-gallon kegs. They moved toward the center on a production line, finally reaching a matter collapser where they were plated with collapsium. From the other side, radioactive isotopes, mostly reactor waste, came in through evacuated and collapsium-shielded chambers, were sorted, and finally, where the cross-arm of the T joined the downstroke, packed in collapsium cases. The production line continued at right angles down the long building, in which the apparatus which converted nuclear energy to electric current was assembled and packed. At the end, the finished power cartridges came off, big ones for heavy machines and tiny ones for things like hand tools and pocket lighters and razors. There were stacks of them, in all sizes, loaded on skids and ready to move out. Except for the minute and unavoidable leakage of current, they were as good as the day they were assembled, and would be for another century. Like almost everything else, the power cartridge plant was airtight and had its own oxygen generator. The air analyzer reported the oxygen insufficient to support life. That was understandable. There were a lot of furnaces which had evidently been hot when the power was cut off. They had burned up the oxygen before cooling. They put on their oxygen equipment when they got out of the car. I'll go back and have a look at the power plant, Matsui said. If it's like the rest of this place, it'll be ready to go as soon as the reactors are started. I wish everybody here had left things like this. Well, we'll have to check everything to make sure nothing was left on when the main power was cut, Khan said. Don't do anything back there till we give you the go-ahead. Matsui nodded and set off on foot along the broad aisle in the middle. Khan looked around in the dim light that filtered through the dusty glass overhead. On either side of the central aisle were two production lines. Between each pair, at intervals, stood massive machines, which evidently fabricated parts for the power cartridges. Over them, and over the machines directly involved in production, were receptor aerials, all oriented toward a stubby tower, twenty feet thick and fifty in height, topped by a hemispherical dome. That'll be the control tower for all the machinery in here, he decided. Ants, suppose you and I go take a look at it. We'll take a look at the machines, Rivas said. Clyde, you and I can work back on the right, and then come back down on the other side. You know anything about this stuff? Me? Niflheim, no, Nichols said. I know a robo-control when I see one, and I know whether it's set to receive or not. There was a self-powered lift inside the control tower. Khan and Ants rode it to the top and got out, Ants snapping on his flashlight. It was dark in the dome at the top. Instead of windows, there were view screens all around it. Five men had worked here. At least, there were four chairs at four intricate control panels, one for each of the four production lines, and a fifth chair in front of a number of communication screens. There was a heavy-duty power unit turned off. Khan threw the switch. Lights came on inside, and the outside view screens lit. They were examining the control panels when Khan's belt radio buzzed. He plugged it in on his helmet. It was Mohammed Matsui. There's a big power plant back here, the engineer said, right in the middle. It only powers what's in front of it. There must be another one in either wing, for the isotope plant and the cartridge case plant. I'll go look at them. But the power's been cut off from the machines in the main building. That's four big switches, one for each production line. He was interrupted by a shout, almost a shriek from somewhere. It sounded like Jerry Rivas. A moment later, Rivas was clamoring. 
Con, what did you turn on? Turn it off, right away! Ants jumped to the switch, pulling it with one hand and getting on his flashlight with the other. The lights went out and the screens went dark. It's off. The dickens it is, Rivas disputed. There are a couple of big supervisor robots circling around, and a flock of workers. At the same time, Clyde Nichols began cursing. Or maybe he was praying. It was hard to be certain. But we pulled the switch. It was only the lights and view screens in here, anyhow. It didn't do any good. Pull another one. Matsui, back at the power plant, was wanting to know what was wrong. Captain Nichols stopped cursing, or praying, and said, Mutiny, that's what! The robots have turned on us! He knew what had happened, or was almost sure he did. A radio impulse had gone out, somehow, from the control tower. Something they hadn't checked, that had been left on. There was just enough current leakage from the units in the robots to keep the receptors active for forty years. The supervisor robots had gone active, and they had activated the rest. Once on, cutting the current from the control tower wouldn't turn them off again. Put the switch in again, Ants. The damage is done, and you won't make it any worse. When the screens came on, he looked around from one to another. The two supervisors, big ovoid things, like the small round ones they had used in repairing the power reactors the first day, were circling aimlessly near the roof one clockwise and the other counterclockwise, dodging obstructions and getting politely out of each other's way. At lower altitude, a dozen assorted worker robots were moving about, and more were emerging from cells at the end of the building. Sweepers, with rotary brooms and rakes, crab-like all-purpose handling robots, a couple of vacuum-cleaning robots, each with a flexible, funnel-tipped proboscis and a bulging dust sack. One thing, a sort of special job designed to get into otherwise inaccessible places, had a twenty-foot, many-jointed, claw-tipped arm in front. It passed by and slightly over the tower, saw Clyde Nichols, and swooped toward him. With a howl, Nichols dived under one of the large machines between two production lines. A pistol went off a couple of times. That would be Jerry Rebus. Nobody else bothered with a gun on Koshai, but he carried one as some people carry umbrellas, whether he expected to need it or not, and because he would feel lost without it. That he took in at one glance. Then he was looking at the control panels. The switches and buttons were all marked for machine control in different steps of power unit production. That was all for the big stuff, powered centrally. There weren't any controls for lifters or conveyors or other mobile equipment. Evidently, they were handled out in the shop, from mobile control vehicles. He did find, on the communication screen panel, a lot of things that had been left on. He snapped them off, one after another, snapping them on when a screen went dark. There were fifteen or twenty robots, some rather large, in the air or moving on the floor by now. We can't do anything here, he told Ants. These are the shop-cleaning robots. They were the last things used here when the place closed down, and the two supervisors were probably controlled from a vehicle, and it's anybody's guess where that is now. When you threw that switch, it sent out an impulse that activated them. They're running their instruction tapes, and putting the others through all their tricks. Three more shots went off. Jerry Rivas was shouting. Hey, what do you know? I killed one of the buggers! There were any number of ways in which a work robot could be shot out of commission with a pistol. All of them would be by the purest of pure luck. The next time we go into a place like this, Khan thought, we take a couple of bazookas along. Turn everything off and let's go. See what we can do outside. Ants put on his flashlight and pulled the switch. They got into the lift and rode down, going outside. As soon as they emerged, they saw a rectangular object fifteen feet long settle over their air car, let down a half dozen clawed arms, and pick it up, flying away with it. 
it had taped instructions to remove anything that didn't belong in the aisleway. It probably asked the supervisor about the air car, and the supervisor didn't return an inhibitory signal, so it went ahead. Con and Ants both shouted at it, knowing perfectly well that shouting was futile. Then they were running for their lives with one of the crab-like all-purpose jobs after them. They dived under the slightly raised bed of a long belt conveyor and crawled. Jerry Rebus fired another shot somewhere. The robot themselves were having troubles. They had done all the work they were supposed to do. Now the supervisors were insisting that they do it all over again. Uncomplainingly, they swept and raked and vacuum-cleaned where they had vacuum-cleaned and raked and swept forty years ago. The scrap-pickers, having picked up all the scrap, were going over the same places and finding nothing, and then getting deflected and gathering a lot of things not defined as scrap, and then circling around, darting away from one another in obedience to their radar-operated evasion systems, and trying to get to the outside scrap pile and finding that the doors wouldn't open because the door openers weren't turned on, and finally dumping what they were carrying when the supervisors gave them no instructions. One of them seemed to have dumped something close to where Clyde Nichols was hiding. If his language had been a little stronger, it would have burned out Con's radio. Their own immediate vicinity being for the moment clear of flying robots, Con and Ants rolled from under the conveyor and legged it between the two production lines. Immediately, three of the crab-like all-purpose handling robots saw them, if that was the word for it, and came dashing for them, followed by a thing that was mostly dump lifter. It was banging its bin lid up and down angrily. About fifty yards ahead, Jerry Reba stepped from behind a machine and fired. One of the handling robots flashed green from underneath, went off contragravity, and came down with a crash. Immediately, like wolves on a wounded companion, the other two pounced upon it, dragging and pulling against each other. That was a hunk of junk. Their orders were to remove it. The mobile trash bin went zooming up to the ceiling, reversed within twenty feet of it, and came circling back to the ground, to go zooming up again. It had gone crazy, literally. It had been getting too many contradictory orders from its supervisor, and its circuits were overloaded and its relays jammed. Rats in mazes, and human-type people in financial difficulties, go psychotic in very much the same way. The two surviving all-purpose robots were also headed for a padded repair shop. They had come close enough to each other to activate their anti-collision safeties. Immediately they flew apart. Then their order to pick up that big piece of junk took over, and they started forward again, to be bounced apart as soon as they were within five feet of one another. If left alone, their power units would run down in a year or so. Until then, they would keep on trying. Soulless intelligences, indeed! Then it occurred to him that for the past, however long it had been, he hadn't heard from Mohammed Matsui. He jiggled his radio. Ham, where are you? Are you still alive? I'm back at the power plant, Matsui said exasperatedly. There's a big thing circling around here. Every time I stick my head out, he makes a dive at me. I didn't know robots would attack people. They don't. He just thinks you're some more trash he's been told to gather up. Matsui was indignant. Khan laughed. On the level, Ham. He has photoelectric vision and a picture of what that aisle is supposed to look like. When you get out in it, he knows you don't belong there and tries to grab you. Hey, there's a lot of junk in here and a couple of baskets at the converter. Say I chuck one out to him, what would he do? Grab it and take it away, like he's taped to do? Okay, wait a minute. They couldn't see the archway to the power plant or even the robot that had Matsui penned up. But after a few minutes, they saw it soaring away, clutching a big wire basket full of broken boxes and other rubbish. It headed for the mutually repelling swarm of robots around the door that wouldn't open for them. 
Khan and Ants and Jerry ran toward the rear, joined by Clyde Nichols, who popped up from behind a pile of spools and electric wire. They made it just before the coffin-shaped thing that had carried off the air car came over to investigate. "'You want to be careful back there,' Matsui told them, as they started toward the temporary safety of the power plant. "'All the reactor repair robots are there. Don't get them on the warpath next.' Of course. There were always repair robots at a power plant, to go into places no human could enter and live. Behind the collapsium shielding, they wouldn't have been activated. Let's have a look at them. What kind? Standard reactor servicers, the same we used at the administration center. Matsui opened the door, and they went into the power plant. Khan and Matsui put on the service power and activated the two supervisors. They, in turn, activated their workers. It was tricky work, getting them all outside the collapsium walled power plant area. Each worker had to be passed through by the supervisor inside, under Matsui's control. Because of the close quarters at which they worked inside the reactor and the converter, they weren't fitted with anti-collision repulsors and, working under close human supervision, they all had audio-visual pickups. It took some time to get adequate screens set up outside the collapsium. Finally, they were ready. Their two supervisors went up to the ceiling, one controlled by Khan and the other by Matsui. The larger, egg-shaped, shop labor supervisors were still moving in irregular orbits. Those of the workers still able to receive signals were trying to obey them, and the rest were jamming in a swarm at the other end. First one, and then the other, of the labor boss robots were captured. They were by now at the end of what might loosely be called their wits. They weren't used to operating without orders, and had been sending out commands largely at random. Now they came to a stop, and then began moving in tight guided circles. One by one, the worker robots still able to heed them were brought to ground and turned off. That left the swarm at the door. The worker robots under the direct control of the power plant supervisors went after them, grappling them and hauling them down to where Ants and Jerry Rebus and Captain Nichols could turn them off manually. The air car was a hopeless wreck. But its radio was still functioning. Con called Charlie Gatworth, who called a gang under Gomez, working not far away. They came with another car. It took all the next day for a gang of six of them to get the place straightened up. Neither Khan nor Gomez, who was a roboticist himself, would trust any of the workers or the two supervisors. Their experiences out of control had rendered them unreliable. They took out their power units and left them to be torn down and repaired later. Other robots were brought in to replace them. When they were through, the power unit cartridge plant was ready for operation. Jerry Rivas wanted to start production immediately. "'We'll have to go back to Poitem pretty soon,' he said. "'We don't want to go back empty. Well, I know that no matter what we dug up and what we could sell or couldn't sell, there's always a market for power unit cartridges.' Electric light units, household appliance units, air car and airboat units, any size at all. We run that plant at full capacity for a few days, and we can load the Harriet barn full, and I'll bet the whole cargo will be sold in a week after we get in. End of chapters 13 and 14「ザ・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロックス・リブロック
The Harriet Barnes settled comfortably at the dock, the bunting swath tugs lifting away from her. They had the outside sound pickups turned as low as possible, and still the noise was deafening. The spaceport was jammed, people on the ground and contragravity vehicles swarming above, with police cars vainly trying to keep them in order. All the bands in Storsenda seemed to have been combined. They were blaring the planetary hymn. Genji Gartner's body lies a-moldering in the tomb, but his soul goes marching on. When they opened the airlock, there was a hastily improvised ceremonial barge, actually a farm scow completely draped in red and white, the planetary colors. They all stopped, briefly, as they came out, to enjoy the novelty of outdoor air, which could actually be breathed. Khan saw his father in the scow, and beside him, Sylvie Jackmont, trying, almost successfully, to keep from jumping up and down in excitement. Morgan Gatworth to meet his son, and Lester Dawes to meet his. Kurt Fawzi, Dolph Kelton, and Colonel Zareff, Tom Brangwen. He didn't see his mother or his sister. Flora he had hardly counted on, but he was disappointed that his mother wasn't there to meet him. Sylvie was embracing her father as he shook hands with his. Then she threw her arms around his neck. "'Oh, Con, I'm so happy. I was watching everything I could on screen, everything you saw and all the places you were, and everything you were doing. The scow, pardon, ceremonial barge, gave a slight lurch, throwing them together. Over her shoulder he saw his father and Eve's Jackmont exchanging grins. Then they had to break it up while he shook hands with Fozzie and Judge Ledoux and the others, and by the time that was over the barge was letting down in front of the stand at the end of the dock, and the band was still deafening heaven with Genji Gartner's body, and they all started up the stairs to be greeted by Planetary President Vykhoven. He looked like an elderly bear who had been too well fed for too long in a zoo, and by Minister General Murchison who represented the Terran Federation on Poitem. He was thin and balding, and he looked as though he had just mistaken the vinegar cruet for the wine decanter. Genji Gartner's soul stopped marching on, but the speeches started, and that was worse. And after the speeches there was the parade, everybody riding in transparent-bodied air cars, and the Lester Dawes and the two ships of the new planetary air navy, and a swarm of gunboats in column five hundred feet above, all firing salutes. In spite of what wasn't, but might just as well have been, a concerted conspiracy to keep them apart, he managed to get a few words privately with Sylvie. "'My mother didn't get here. Is anything wrong?' "'Is anything anything else?' I've been in the middle of it ever since you went away. Your mother's still moaning about all these companies your father's promoting. He never used to do anything like that, and it's all too big, and it's going to end in a big smash. And then she gets on to Merlin. You know, she won't say Merlin. She always calls it that thing. I've noticed that. Then she begins talking about all the horrible things that'll happen when it's found, and that sets Flora off. Flora says Merlin's a big fake, and you and your father are using it to rob thousands of widows and orphans of their life savings. And that sets your mother off again. Self-sustaining cyclic reaction, like the Beta Solar Phoenix. And every time I try to pour a little oil on the troubled waters, I find I've gotten it on the fire instead. And then Flora had this fight with Wade Lucas. And, of course, she blames you for that. Good heavens, why? Well, she couldn't blame it on herself, could she? Oh, you mean, why the fight? Lucas is in business with your father now, and she can't convince him that you and your father are a pair of quadruple-dyed villains, I suppose. Anyhow... The engagement is fth. Khan, is my father going back to Koshai? As soon as we can round up some people to help us on the ship. 
Then I'm going along. I've had it, Con. I'm a combat fatigue case. But, Sylvie, that isn't any place for a girl. Oh, Pooh, this is Sylvie. We're old war buddies. We soldiered together on Barathrum, remember? Well, you'd be the only girl, and... That's what you think. If you expect to get any kind of a gang together, at least a third of them will be girls. A lot of technicians are girls, and when work gets slack, they're always the first ones to get shoved out of jobs. I'll bet there are a thousand girl technicians out of work here. Any line of work you want to name. I know what I'll do. I'll make a telecast appearance. I still have some news value from the Barathrum business. Want to bet that I won't be the working girl's Joan of Arc by this time next week? That cheered him. A girl can punch any kind of a button a man can, and a lot of them knew what buttons to punch, and why. Say, she could find fifty girls. He had a slightly better chance to talk to his father before the banquet at the Executive Palace that evening. They shared the same suite at the Ritz-Gartner, and even welcoming committees seldom chase their victims from bedroom to bath. "'Yes, I know all about it,' Rodney Maxwell said bitterly. "'I was home a couple of weeks ago. Flora simply will not speak to me, and your mother begged me, in tears, to quit everything we're doing here. I tried to give her some idea of what would happen if I dropped this. Even supposing I could, she wouldn't listen to me.' He finished putting the studs in his shirt. "'You still think this is worth what it's costing us?' You saw the views we sent back. There's work on Koshai for a million people, at least. Why, even these two makeshift ships they're putting together here at Storsenda are giving work, one way or another, to almost a thousand. Think what things will be like a year from now, if this keeps on. Rodney Maxwell gave a wry laugh. Didn't know I had a real Simon Pure altruist for a son. Partner, when you call me that... Smile. I am smiling, with some slight difficulty. He didn't think well of the banquet. Back in Litchfield, Senta would have fired half her human help and taken a sledgehammer to a robo-chef for a meal like that. Even his father's camp cook would have been ashamed of it. And there were more speeches. President Vykoven managed to get hold of him and Eves Jackmont afterward, and steered them into his private study. "'Have you any real reason for thinking that Merlin might be on Koshai?' the planetary president asked. "'Great goo, no! We weren't looking for Merlin, Mr. President. We were looking for a hypership. We have one, too. Calling her Ouroboros II. Twenty-five hundred footer. We expect to have her in space in a few months.' I surely don't need to tell you what that will do toward restoring planetary prosperity. No, of course not. A hypership of our own. But, he looked from one to the other of them, but I understand that this Mr. Kurt Fawzi was saying. Mr. Fawzi is looking for Merlin here on Poitem. If anybody finds it, that's where it'll be found. I'm interested in getting business started again. If Merlin is found, it would help, of course. He shrugged. Don't look at me, Jackmont said. Mr. Maxwell, both of them, father and son, want some spaceships. They hired me to help build them. That's all I have in it. Then he relit the cigar the president had given him and leaned back in his chair, staring at the stuffed alsasoid head with the seven-foot horn spread above the fireplace. Khan described the interview to his father after they were back at the hotel. "'I hope you convinced him. You know, he's afraid of Merlin. A lot of people have been saying that if Merlin's found, it should be used to determine government policy. A few extremists are beginning to say that Merlin ought to be the government, and Jake Vykhoven and his cronies ought to be dumped. Into the handiest mass-energy converter, preferably.' You know, if anybody found Merlin and started it auditing the planetary treasury, 
Jake Weichhoven would be the one who'd be wanting a hypership. Tom Brangwen ran him down the next morning, in the dining room. "'Con, I wish you'd come along with me,' he said. "'Some of us are up in Kurt's suite. We'd all like to talk to you.' Somehow he was acting as though he were making an arrest. That might have been nothing but professional habit. Con went up to Fozzie's suite, and found Fozzie and Judge Ledoux and Dolph Kelton, and close to a dozen others there. "'I'm glad you could come, Con,' the judge greeted him. Now that the defendant had arrived, the trial could begin. "'I wish your father could have gotten here. I asked him to come, but he had a prior engagement. A meeting with some of the financial people here, about some company he's interested in.' "'That's right. Tri-System and Interstellar Space Lines.' "'Interstellar!' Kurt Fozzy almost howled. Great goo! Now it isn't enough to go out to Koshai. He wants to go clear out of the Tri system. That's what we wanted to talk about. All this nonsense you and your father are in. Merlin's right here on Poitem. It's right at Force Command. And if your father hadn't robbed us of all our best men, like Jerry Revis and Anse Dawes, we'd have found it by now. I don't think you and your father care a hoot if we ever find Merlin or not. Kurt, that's a dreadful thing to say, Dolph Kelton objected in a shocked voice. It's a dreadful thing to have to say, Fozzie replied. But you tell me what Con Maxwell or Rodney Maxwell are doing to help find it. Who showed you where the Force Command was? Clem Zeref asked. Nobody could think of any good quick comeback to that. Khan took advantage of the pause to ask, Why do you want to find Merlin? Why do we— Fozzie sputtered in dignity. If you don't know— I know why I do. I want to see if you do. Do you? Merlin would answer so many questions, Dolph Kelton told him gently. Questions I can't answer for myself. With Merlin, we could set up a legal code and a system of jurisprudence that would give everybody absolute justice, Judge Ledoux said. As if absolute justice wasn't the last thing anybody in his right senses would want, a robot judge would have the whole planet in jail inside a month. We have a man who joined us after you went off to Koshai, Khan, Franz Veltrin said. A Mr. Carl Liebert. He's some kind of a clergyman from over Morven Way. He says that Merlin could formulate an entirely new religion, which would regenerate humanity. Well, I don't have such lofty ideas, Fozzie said. I just want Merlin to show us how to get some prosperity here, bring things back to what they were before Poitem went broke. And that's what Father and I are trying to do. You're going into the woods with a book on how to chop down a tree and no axe. Fozzie looked at him in surprise, started to say something, and thought better of it. If we want prosperity, we need tools. Our problem is loss of markets. If we find Merlin, and tape it with everything that's happened in the forty years since it was shut down, Merlin will tell us where to find new markets. But the markets won't come to us. We'll have to do our own exporting, and we'll need ships. Now, you men have been studying about Merlin and hunting for Merlin all your lives. I can't add anything to what you know, and neither can my father. You find Merlin, and we'll have the ships ready when you do find it. Kurt, I think he has a point, somebody said. You're blasted well right he has, Clem Zareff put in. If it wasn't for Con Maxwell, you know where we'd be back in Litchfield, sitting around in Kurt's office, talking about how wonderful things'll be when we find Merlin, and doing nothing to find it. Kurt, I believe Khan is entitled to an apology, Judge Ledoux ruled. How close we are to finding Merlin, I don't know, but it is due to him that we have any hope of finding it at all. Khan, I'm sorry, Fozzie said. I oughtn't to have said some of the things I did. But we're all on edge. We've been having so much trouble. 
Khan, it's right there at Force Command. I know it is. We've been all over the place. We have shafts sunk at each of the corners. We've used scanners, and we've put off echo shots. Nothing. We looked for additional passages out of the headquarters, but there aren't any. But it has to be somewhere around. It just has to be. Maybe if I go out to Force Command with you, I might see something you've overlooked. And if I can't, I'll try to scrape up some stuff on Koshai for you. Deep vein scanners, that sort of thing, from the mines. They took the Lester Dawes out at a little past noon and turned south and east. Everybody aboard was happy, except Con Maxwell. He was thinking of the years and years ahead of these trusting, hopeful old men, each year the grave of another expectation. Two hundred miles from Force Command, the Goblin met them, her side still spalled and dented from the hit she had taken in Barathrum spaceport. When they came in sight of it, the mesa top was deserted. Fozzie began wondering where in Niflheim all the drilling rigs and the seismo trucks were. Somebody with a pair of binoculars called attention to activity on the side of the high butte on top of which the relay station was located. Fozzie began swearing exasperatedly. Might be something Mr. Lieber thought of, Franz Veltrin suggested. Then why in blazes didn't he screen us about it? Who is this Liebert? Kahn asked. Somebody mentioned him this morning, I think. He joined us after you left, Kahn, Dolph Kelton said. He's a clergyman from Morven. No regular denomination. He has a sect of his own. Yeah, he would, Clem Zeref rumbled. Pious fraud. He's really a good man, Kahn. Clem's prejudiced. He says we ought to use Merlin to show us the true nature of God, and how to live in accordance with the divine will. He says Merlin can teach us a new religion. A new religion, based on Merlin. That would be good. And then the fanatics who thought Merlin was the devil would start a holy war to wipe out the servants of Satan, and with all of the combat equipment that was lying around on this planet. For the first time since his business started, he began to feel really frightened. An air car came bulleting away from the butte and landed on the mesa as the Lester Dawes sat down. The man who met them at the head of the vertical shaft wore Federation fatigues, baggy trousers, ankle boots, and a long smock, dyed black. He was bareheaded, and his white hair was almost shoulder-long. He had a white beard. "'Welcome, brothers,' he greeted, a hand raised in benediction. And who is this with you? His voice was high and quavery. Not a good pulpit voice, Kahn thought. Kurt Fawzi introduced Kahn, and Liebert grasped his hand with a grip that was considerably stronger than his voice. Bless you, young man. It is to you alone that we owe our thanks that we are about to find the great computer. Every sapient being in the galaxy will honor your name for a thousand years. Well, I hadn't counted on quite that much, Mr. Liebert. If it'll only help a few of these people make a decent living, I'll be satisfied. Liebert shook his head sadly. You think entirely in material terms, young man, he reproved. Forget these things. Acquire the higher spiritual values. The great computer must not be degraded to such uses. We should let it show us how to lift ourselves to a high spiritual plane. It went on like that, after they went down to Fox Travis's, now Fozzie's, office, where there were silver-stoppered decanters instead of the old green-glass pitcher, and gold-plated ashtrays, and thick carpets on the floor. The man was a lunatic. He made Fozzie's office gang look frigidly sane. Furthermore, he was an ignoramus. He had no idea what a computer could or couldn't do. Anybody who could build a computer of the sort he thought Merlin was wouldn't need it. He would be God. As he talked, Khan began to be nagged by an odd sense of recognition. He'd seen this Carl Liebert before, somewhere, and somehow he was sure that the long white hair and the untrimmed beard weren't part of the picture. 
that puzzled him. He doubted if he'd have remembered Liebert from six years ago, almost seven now, though a lot of itinerant evangelists showed up in Litchfield. That might have been it. "'I tell you, the great computer is there, in the heart of the Butte,' Liebert was insisting now. "'It has been revealed to me in a dream. It is completely buried. After it was made, no human touched it. The men who were here and used it in the war communicated with it only by radio.' "'That could be so. There were fully robotic computers intended for use in places where no human could go and live. There was a big one on Niflheim, armored against the fluorine atmosphere and the hydrofluoric acid rains. But there was no point in that here. The things were enormously complicated, and military engineering of any sort emphasized simplicity. Ugh! Was he beginning to believe this balderdash himself? Clem Zara fell in with him as they were going to dinner. "'Revealed in a dream,' the old rebel snorted. "'One thing you can always get away with lying about is what you dream.' "'You think he's lying? I think he's just crazy.' "'That's what he wants you to think. Look, hon, he knows Merlin is here. He's trying to keep us from it. That's why he shifted all that equipment over on the Butte.' He's working for Sam Murchison. I thought your theory was that the Federation had lost Merlin. It was, at first. It doesn't look that way to me now. It's right here at Force Command somewhere. They don't want it found, and they're going to do everything they can to stop us. I oughtn't to have left this fellow Liebert here alone. Well, I won't do that again. Get Tom Brangwen to help me. Chapter 16 The voyage back to Koshai had been a week-long nightmare. When she had been the pride and budget wrecker of Transcontinent and Overseas Airline, the Harriet Barn had accommodated two hundred first-class and five hundred lower-deck passengers, but the conversion to a spaceship had drastically reduced her capacity. The three hundred men and women who had been recruited for the Koshai colony had been crammed into her with brutal disregard for comfort, privacy, or anything else except the ability of the air recyclers to keep them breathing. When Captain Nichols set her down at the administration building at Port Carpenter, a few had to be carried off, but they were all alive, which made the trip an unqualified success. The dozen leaders of the expedition were congratulating themselves on that in one of the executive offices after the first dinner at Port Carpenter. Rodney Maxwell, in Storsenda, had joined them in screen image. He was mostly listening, and sometimes contributing a remark apropos of something the rest of them had said five minutes ago. Our hypership, Khan was saying, is going to have to be item two on the agenda. The first thing we need is a ship for the Poitam Koshai run. By this time next year, we ought to have a thousand to fifteen hundred people here at the least. We can't haul them all on that flying sardine can. We'll need supplies, too. What was left here won't last forever, Nichols said. And you're going to have to run this at a profit, Luther Chen Wong who had come along for first-hand experience and to help with administrative work, added, "'You have a big payroll to meet, and you'll have to keep the stockholders happy. People like Jethro Sastraman and some of these Storsunda bankers aren't going to be satisfied with promises and long-term prospects. They'll want dividends.' "'We'll have to get claims staked on something besides Port Carpenter, too.' Those ships that are building at Storsenda will be finished before long, Jerry Rivas said. If we don't get some more things claimed, the first thing you know, we'll own Port Carpenter and nothing else. Well, let's see what we can find in the way of a big airboat or a small ship, Con said. Jerry, you can pick a party for exploring. 
Just zigzag around the planet and transmit in locations and views of whatever you find, and we'll send it on to store sender. And don't pick anybody for your exploring party that can't be spared from anything here, Jackmont added. We don't want to have to chase you halfway around the world to bring back the only specialist in something yesterday at the latest. Are you going to come along, Con? Rivas asked. Oh, Lord, no. I'm going to be doing fifteen things at once here. All the computer work. Finding materials to make astrogational equipment and robopilots. Studying hyperspace theory. Fortunately, there was an excellent library here and setting up classes and teaching school, and keeping in touch with his father on Poitem. It was making him nervous not to know what sort of foolishness the older and wiser heads might be getting into. The next morning they began organizing work gangs and setting up committees. Three men, two girls, and about twenty robots got an open-pit iron mine started. As soon as the steel mill was ready, or started coming in. Ants Dawes had a gang looking for something they could build a 350-foot interplanetary ship out of. Jackmont and Mac Vibart were getting plans and specifications, and making lists of needed materials. Khan gathered a dozen men and women and started classes in computer theory and practice. At the same time, he and Charlie Gatworth were teaching themselves and each other hyperspatial astrogation, which was the art of tossing a ship into some everythingless non-space outside normal space-time, and then pulling her out again by her bootstraps at some other place in the normal continuum light-years away. Roughly, it compared to shooting hummingbirds on the wing, blindfolded, with a not particularly accurate pistol from a mile-a-minute merry-go-round. That was something you could only do with a computer. A human, with a slide rule, a pencil and pad, could figure it out, of course, if he had fifty-odd thousand years to do it. A good computer did it in thirty seconds. That was one difference between people and computers. The other difference was that the desirability of making a hyperspace jump would never occur to a computer unless somebody pushed a button and taped in instructions. They found a three-hundred-foot globular skeleton, probably the nucleus of a big hyperspace ship, and decided that it was big enough for what they wanted. The entire colony got to work on it. Photo-printed plans and specifications poured out as Jackmont and a couple of draftsmen got them up. Steel came out of the steel mill at one end, while ore came in at the other. A swarm of big contragravity machines, some robotic and some human-operated, clustered around the skeleton hull like hornets building a nest. Tri-system and interstellar space lines was chartered. The lawyers reported having to overcome a little more resistance than usual from the government about that. And the bill to nationalize Merlin, which had died in committee, was resuscitated, and was being debated hotly on the floor of the Parliament. The administration was now supporting it. Are they completely crazy? Khan wanted to know when he heard about that. They passed that bill and nobody's going to look for Merlin if they know the government will snatch it as soon as they find it. That is precisely Jake Weichhoven's idea, his father replied. I told you he was afraid of Merlin. He's getting more afraid of it every day. He had reason to. There was a growing sentiment in favor of turning the entire government over to the computer as soon as it was found. To his horror, Khan heard himself named as chairman of a committee that should be set up to operate it. The moderates, who had merely wanted Merlin used in an advisory capacity, were dropping out. The agitation was coming from extremists who wanted Merlin to be the whole government, and now the extremists were developing an extreme wing of their own, who called themselves cybernarchists, and started wearing colored shirt uniforms, and greeting each other with an archaic stiff-arm salute, and the words, Hail Merlin! and the followers of the gospel-shouter on the west coast were now cropping up all over the mainland, 
and on the continent of Acair to the north. And another cult, non-religious, was convinced that Merlin was a living machine, with conscious intelligence of its own, and awesome psi powers, a sort of super-golem, which, if found and awakened, would enslave the whole galaxy. Fortunately, these two hated each other as venomously as both did the cybernarchists, and spent most of their energies attacking each other's meetings. The news services were beginning to publish casualty lists, some heavy enough for outpost fighting between a couple of regular armies. One thing, it helped the employment situation. Everybody was hiring mercenaries. But what, Khan asked, are the sane people doing? You ought to know, his father told him. I suspect that you have all of them on Koshai now. The sane people, if that was what they were, were being busy. They were putting a set of Abbott lift-and-drive engines together, and Khan's computer class was estimating the mass of the finished ship, and the amount of energy needed to overcome gravitation and give it constant acceleration from Koshai to Poitem. They were learning, by trial and error, largely error, how to build a set of pseudograv engines. And they were putting together a hundred and one other things, all of which was good training for the time they'd be ready to start work on Ouroboros II. Jerry Rivas had found a contragravity craft, which seemed to have been used by some top official for business and inspection trips, had gathered a crew of non-specialists who weren't urgently needed at Port Carpenter, and set out to circumnavigate the planet. It worked just the reverse of expectation. He found a big uranium mine, with an isotope separation plant and a battery of plutonium breeders. That meant that Mohammed Matsui and a half-dozen other nuclear power people had to get into another boat and speed after them to see what he had really found. As soon as they landed, Rivas took off again to discover a copper mine and a complex of smelters and processing plants. That took a few more experts, or reasonable facsimiles, away from Port Carpenter. He then found a whole city that manufactured nothing but computers and robo-controls and things like that. Khan loaded his whole computer theory class onto a freight scow and took them there. By the time he landed, his father was screening him from Storsenda. "'When are you going to get the ship finished?' he was asking. "'Kurt Fawzi's pestering the daylights out of me. He wants that equipment you promised him.' "'We're working on it. What's happened? Has Carl Liebert had another revelation?' "'I don't know about that. Kurt's sure Merlin is directly under force command.' "'And speaking about Liebert, Clem Zareff's been after me about him. You know I have contracted for the full-time and exclusive services of this Barton Massara detective agency. Well, Clem wants me to put them to work investigating Liebert. Yes, I know, Liebert's a Terran Federation spy. Why do you need the full-time services of the biggest private detective agency on Poitem? There have been some odd things happening. People have been trying to bribe and intimidate some of my office help. I have found microphones and screen pickups planted around. I caught one of our clerks trying to make copies of voice tapes. I think it's some of these other Merlin-chasing companies trying to find out how close we are to it. Clem Zareff is recruiting more guards. But how soon are you going to get that ship built? We're working on it. That's all I know now. He went back to work getting a classroom ready for his students. If he'd accepted that instructorship at Montevideo, he wouldn't be a full professor now, but none of the rest of this would be happening either. That night, he had the dream about starting the big machine and not being able to stop it again. There was street fighting in Storsenda between the cybernarchists and government troops. There was a pitched battle in the West between the Armageddonists Merlin is Satan, and the Human Supremacy League, Merlin is the Gollum, with heavy losses and claims of victory on both sides. President Weichhoven proclaimed planet-wide martial law. 
and then discovered he had nothing to enforce it with. Luther Chen Wang screened him from Port Carpenter. His voice was almost inaudibly low at first. Con, I just got a call from Jerry and Clyde. I think we can knock off work on that ship we're building now. We won't need it. Have they found a ship? If they had, it would be the first one anybody had found. Where? They haven't found a ship, Con. They found all of them. All the ships in the Alpha system, except the Harriet Barn and the two we're building at Storacenda. The place is marked on the map as Sickle Mountain Naval Observatory. It's just a bitty little dot, but the map was made before the evacuation started. It's where most of the troops in the system were embarked on hyperships, I think. Wait till I show you the views. Khan put on another screen. The first view is from an altitude of five miles. He didn't need Luther's voice to identify Sickle Mountains, a long curve with a spur at right angles to one end. The name must have suggested itself to whoever saw it first. The observatory had been built where the handle of the sickle joined the blade. As the ship from which the view had been taken had approached, the details grew plainer. At the same time, it became evident that the plane inside the curve of the sickle was powdered with tiny sparkles, like tinsel dust on a red-brown velvet. Great goo! Are those all ships? That's right. Look at this one now. The view changed. The aircraft was down now, below the crest of the mountain, circling slowly above the plain. Hundreds. No, over a thousand of them, two and three and five hundred footers, and here and there a thousand footer, that could have been converted into a hypership if anybody had wanted to take the trouble. The view changed again, this time from an air car dropped from the ship, he supposed. It was down almost to the tops of the ships, and he could read names and home ports. Pixie, Chloris, Helen Oloy, Anitis. They were from Jurgen. Sky Rover, Port Saunders, she was from Horvendil, ships from Storcenda and Yellowmarsh on Janico, and now we know where they all went. It was logical, of course. Most of the hyperships used in the evacuation had been built here. It had been less trouble to lead the troops and the civilian workers from Poitem and the other planets onto small normal spaceships and bring them here than to take the big ships away on short interplanetary runs to the other planets. Have you screened my father yet? Yes. This is going to knock the bottom out of the companies that are building those ships at Storacenda, I'm afraid. They're tough luck. It could be everybody's tough luck. Both these companies have been issuing stock, and there's been a lot of speculation in it. This market's so inflated now that a puncture at one place might blow the whole thing out. He knew that. He shrugged. Father will have to think of something. Tell him I'll screen him from Sickle Mountain. Then he went back to his classroom. All right. Class dismissed, he said. You have twenty minutes to get your bags packed. We're going to work for real now. Airboats and airships flocked to Sickle Mountain. Some of them hastened back to Port Carpenter for loads of food, for there was none in the storehouses at the embarkation camp. They inspected ship after ship, and chose two three-hundred-footers. They sent airships and freight scows to the dozen-odd cities and industrial centers that had been already explored to gather cargo, as far as possible, the items in shortest supply on Poitem. Don't worry about a market smash, his father told him. We have that taken care of. Tri-System Investments has just bought up a lot of stock in both of those companies, and we've set up agreements with them, informally, of course, we'll have to get them voted on by our own companies, to sell them ships from Koshai. In return, the company that's building the ship out of four air freighters will go to Janico. And the company that's building a ship out of the old Leitzenring building will go to Jurgen, and they'll both stay off Koshai. 
Sturber Flynn and Chen Wang will probably be defending antitrust suits to the end of time. The planetary government has stopped liking us, you know. Then we'll have to get one that will like us. There'll be an election about this time next year, won't there? His father nodded. To use one of your expressions, we're working on it. How soon can you get your ships in? We'll be loaded and ready to lift off in a week. Another week for the trip. Well, don't forget that equipment you promised Kurt Fozzy. We'll have that on. Jerry Revis is gathering it up now. How are you fixed for arms on Koshai? Arms? Why, there are some. There was a pretty big force of space marines on duty here, and they left everything they couldn't carry in their hands. Why? The Armageddonists and Cybernarchists and Human Supremacy bought all you had on hand? They're buying, but I wasn't thinking of that. I was thinking that your crews might need something to argue their way off the ships at Store Senda with. Things are getting just slightly rugged here now. End of chapters 15 and 16「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org.」Reading by Mark Nelson「The Cosmic Computer」by H. Beam Piper Chapter 17 there were no bands or speeches when they came in this time. A lot of contragravity vehicles circled widely around the spaceport, but except for a few news service cars, the police were keeping them back of a two-mile radius around the landing pits. A couple of gunboats were making tight circles above, and on the dock were more vehicles and a horde of police guards. When Rodney Maxwell came across the bridge from the dock after they opened the airlocks, he was followed by a dozen Barton Massara private police, as villainous-looking a collection of ruffians as Khan had ever seen. He was wearing a new suit, with a waist-length jacket instead of the long coat he usually wore, and there was a holstered automatic on each hip. In Litchfield, he never carried more than one pistol and Storacenda was supposed to be an orderly place where nobody needed to go armed. More than anything else, that told Khan approximately what had been going on while he had been on Koshai. "'Ship guard,' his father told Eves Jackmont. "'All your crew can come off. They'll take care of things. Get your people in that troop carrier over there. Everybody will stay at Interplanetary Building. None of the hotels are safe.' not even the Ritz-Gartner. And be sure everybody's well-armed when they come off the ship. Jack Mott nodded. I know the drill. I've been in Poto Berth on Venus and Scorvan on Loki. Any law we want, we make for ourselves. That's about it. I'll see you there. Con, I wish you'd come with me. Somebody here wants to talk to you. He wondered if his mother, or Flora, had come to Storsenda. When he asked his father as they crossed onto the dock, there was a brief twinge of pain in Rodney Maxwell's face. No, they're not having anything to do. Duck! Quick! Then his father was diving under a lifter truck that stood empty on the dock. The private police were scattering for cover, and an auto cannon began pom poming. Khan took one quick look in the direction in which it was firing, saw an air car that had broken through the police line and was rushing toward them, and dived under the lifter after his father. As he did, he saw a missile flash out from one of the gunboats like a thrown knife. Then he huddled beside his father and put his arms over his head. He felt the heat and shock of the explosion, and, an instant later, heard the roar. 
When nothing immediately disastrous happened after he had counted fifteen seconds, he stuck his head out and looked up. The gunboat was struggling to regain her equilibrium, and the aircar had vanished in a fireball. They both emerged straightening. His father was brushing himself with his hands and saying something about always having to duck under something when he had a new suit on. Robot control, probably. Could have been launched from anywhere in town. Why, no. Your mother and Flora aren't speaking to either of us any more. Pity, of course, but I'm glad they're in Litchfield. It's a little healthier there." They walked to the slim recon car and climbed in, pulling the door shut after them. Wade Lucas was waiting for them at the controls. "'There, you see,' he began, as soon as he had the car lifting, "'what I've been telling you? We'll have to stop this. Con, meet our new partner. I told him everything you told me, out on the mall, the day you came home. I had to. His father hastened to add. He'd figured most of it out for himself. The only thing to do was admit him to the lodge and give him the oath. I didn't know about General Travis. I didn't even know he was still alive, Lucas said. But the rest of it was pretty obvious, once I stopped jumping to conclusions and did a little thinking. You know, ever since I came here, I've been preaching to these people to stop looking for Merlin and do something to help themselves. You're smarter than I am, Con. Instead of opposing them, you're guiding them. Did you tell Flora? Lucas shook his head. I tried to explain what you're trying to do, but she wouldn't listen. She just told me I'd gotten to be as big a crook as you two. He had the car up fifty thousand putting it into a wide circle around the city. He locked the controls and got out his cigarettes. "'Rod, we've got to stop this. You were just lucky this time. Some of these days your luck's going to run out.' "'How can we stop?' Con demanded. "'Tell them the truth. They lynch us and then go hunting for Merlin.' "'Worse than that. It'd be a smash worse than the one when the war ended.' I was only ten then, but I can remember that very plainly. We can't stop it, and we wouldn't dare stop it if we could." "'What's been going on here in the last month?' Con asked. "'I've been too busy to keep in touch. I know there's been rioting, and these crackpot sects, but I think this is personal to us. There have been some ugly things happening. There were four attempts to burglarize our offices. I told you about some of the other stuff, the microphones we found and so on. The worst thing was Lucy Nocero, my secretary. She just vanished a couple of weeks ago. Three days later, the police found her wandering in a park, a complete imbecile. Somebody who either didn't know how to use one, or didn't care what happened, had used a mind probe on her. It's twenty to one she'll never recover. It's this Storacenda financial crowd, Wade Lucas said. They had things all their own way, till Alpha Interplanetary was organized. Now they're getting shoved into the background, and they don't like it. They're making more money than they ever did, and they just love it, Rodney Maxwell said. I'd think it was either Jake Vykoven or Sam Murchison. Murchison, Lucas hooted. Why, he's nobody. Federation Minister-General, all the authority of the Terran Federation and nothing to enforce it with. He doesn't have a position here. He has a disease, sleeping sickness. He certainly doesn't believe there is a Merlin, does he? Con asked. I don't know what he believes, but he's getting to be Clem Zeriff's opposite number. He thinks this whole thing's a plot against the Federation. It's a good thing Clem didn't get around to repainting his combat vehicles black and green, the way he did the home guard stuff at Litchfield. I'd be more likely to think it was Vykhoven. Could be. Or it could be the Armageddonists, or human supremacy. I am ashamed to say that this Heil Merlin cybernarchist gang are friendly to us. Or it could be some of the banking crowd, or some of these rival space companies. Barton Massara is trying to find out. Well, we have some of Wade's pet suspects at Interplanetary Building now. 
There's been a meeting going on for the last week to partition the Alpha Gartner system. The interplanetary building had been a medium-class residence hotel at the time of the war. Junior staff officers and civilian technicians and their families had lived there. It had been vacant ever since the disastrous outbreak of peace. Now it had a big new floor-light sign, and housed the offices of all the Maxwell companies. There was a truculent display of anti-vehicle weapons on the top landing stage, and more Bart and Macera private police. They looked even more villainous than the ones at the spaceport. Khan recalled having heard that most of the Blackie Perales gang had been discharged for lack of evidence. He wondered how many of them had been hired with Barton Macera. The meeting was in a big conference room, six floors down. It had been going on uninterrupted for days, with all the interested company's representatives standing watch and watch around the clock. Lester Dawes and Morgan Gatworth and Lorenzo Minardis were there for L, E, and S. Transcontinent and overseas was represented. There were people from Alpha Interplanetary, and bankers and financiers, and people from the companies building the two ships at the spaceport. And J. Fitzwilliam Sturber, the lawyer. And reporters, phoning stories in and getting audiovisual interviews of anybody who would hold still long enough. They converged in a rush as Khan and his father and Lucas came in. No statement, gentlemen, Rodney Maxwell shouted above the babble of their questions. When we have anything to release, it will be released to all of you. Jackmont and Nichols had already arrived. Lucas went to them and began talking about stevedores and lifters to get off the cargoes from the ships. Khan hastened to join them. The scanning and mining equipment aboard the Helen Oloy, he said. That shouldn't be unloaded here. We'll take the ship out to force command and unload it there. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw a lurking reporter snatch the handphone off his radio and begin talking. It would be stated authoritatively that Merlin was at force command and would be uncovered as soon as special equipment from Koshai arrived. Everybody at the long table was shouting at everybody else. The Jurgen and Janico companies wanted to buy ships from Koshai Exploitation and Development. The Alpha Interplanetary Director, who was also a Vice President of Transcontinent and Overseas, opposed that. Another Director of AI, who was also Board Chairman of Koshai Exploitation and Development, wanted to sell ships to anybody who had the price. The transcontinent and overseas man was calling him a traitor to the company. And one of the stockbrokers, who was also a vice president of Tri-System Investments and a director of Tri-System and Interstellar Space Lines, was wanting to know which company. And a banker, who was stockholder in all the companies, was shouting that they were all a gang of crooks. And J. Fitzwilliam Sturber was declaring that anybody who called him a crook could continue the discussion through seconds. Khan suddenly realized that dueling had never been illegal on Poitem. He wondered how many duels this meeting was going to hatch. The next afternoon the Helen O'Loy was unloaded, all but the mining equipment. Khan and Eves Jackmont and Charlie Gatworth and a few others took her out to force command. They were met by Clem Zareff's armed airboats two hundred and fifty miles from the Mesa and they found the place in more of a state of siege than when the Badlands had been full of outlaws. A lot of heavy armament seemed to have been moved in from Barathrum spaceport, and Zareff had more men and firepower than he had ever commanded during the System States War. If Minister General Murchison was convinced that the Merlin excitement was a cover for some seditious plot against the Federation, this ought to give him food for thought. There was still work, mostly boring lateral shafts for echo shots, going on at the Butte, under the relay station. That was Liebert, who was still insisting that that was where Merlin was buried. There was also some work on top of the Mesa, by those who were convinced that that was where Merlin was to be found. Kurt Fawzi was taking the lead in that. Franz Veltrin and Dolph Kelton sided with Liebert and Fawzi's office clique had split into two factions. 
Judge Ledoux was maintaining strict impartiality, as befitted his judicial position. "'Why hasn't your father gotten those detectives of his to work on this fake preacher?' Zaref wanted to know, when he and Tom Brangwen were able to talk to Kahn alone. "'Well, they've been busy,' Kahn said, "'trying to keep him alive, for one thing. You heard about the robo-bomb somebody launched at us the day we brought the ships in, didn't you?' "'Yes, and we heard about the Nocero girl, too,' Brangwen said. "'But hasn't it ever occurred to you or your dad that this fellow that calls himself Liebert might be mixed up with the gang that did that?' "'You suspect him, too?' Brangwen nodded. "'I took a few audio-visuals of him, when he didn't know it. I sent them to some different law enforcement people over in Morven, where he says he comes from. They never saw him before.' and couldn't find anybody who did. Well, he just doesn't have a police record, then. He says he's a preacher. Preachers don't go off in the woods by themselves to preach. They get up in pulpits, in front of a lot of people. Those towns over in Morven are small enough for everybody to have known something about him. He's a fake, I tell you. Let me have copies of those audio-visuals, Tom. I'll see what can be found out about him. I'm beginning to wonder about him myself. I'm sure I've seen him somewhere. When he got back to Storsenda, he found that the marathon conference on the sixth floor down at the interplanetary building had finally come to an end. Everybody seemed satisfied, and apparently nobody was going to have pistols and coffee with anybody else about it. We have things fixed up, his father told him. The gang who are building the ship out of four air freighters are chartered as Janico Industries Limited. They are going to specialize in chemical products. The other company has a charter now, too. They are going to operate on Jurgen and Horvendil. We'll sell them the ships, and Alpha Interplanetary will put on scheduled trips to all three planets, and also Koshai. We're getting along very nicely with them, except that everybody is competing for technicians and skilled labor. We have two hundred more people signed up for Koshai. What you want to do is train as many of them as you can for ship operation. Alpha Interplanetary is going to start a training program here at Storsenda. You'd better leave one of your ships for them to work on, and send back as many ships as you can find officers and crews for. We're getting things really started. Yes. The only trouble is, his father frowned, I don't understand these people, Khan. Everybody ought to be making millions out of this by this time next year. But all any of them, even these Storacenda bankers, can talk about is how soon we're going to find Merlin. I wish we could stop that somehow. Listen, I have it. Merlin never was on Poitem. Merlin was a space station a few thousand miles off-planet. There was a crew of operators aboard, and they communicated with Force Command by radio. When the war ended, they took it outside the system and shot off a planet buster inside her. No more Merlin. How would that be? His father shook his head. Wouldn't do. If anybody believed it, which I doubt, they'd just quit. The market would collapse, everybody would be broke, it would be just the end of the war all over again. Khan, we can't let it stop now. We're going too fast to stop. If we tried it, we'd smash up and break our necks. Chapter 18 Jerry Rivas, Mac Vibart, and Luther Chen Wong had been keeping things running on Koshai. Work on the interplanetary ship at Port Carpenter had stopped when the Sickle Mountain ships had been found. It had never been resumed. When Khan returned, he found work started on the Ouroboros too. Some of the two hundred newcomers who came in on the Helen O'Loy had special skills needed on the hypership. Most of them went with Clyde Nichols and Charlie Gatworth to Sickle Mountain to train as normal space officers and crewmen. Some of them, it was hoped, would later qualify for hyperspace work. Sylvie, who had been one of the star pupils in the computer class, was now helping him with the long lists of needed materials, some of which had to be brought from other places as much as a thousand miles away. Jerry Rivas went back to exploring. 
Nichols had to drop his space training work temporarily to organize a fleet of air freighters. Usually the men best able to operate them were urgently needed on some job at the construction dock. Ships lifted out almost daily from Sickle Mountain. They tried to get some kind of saleable cargo for each one, without depriving themselves of what they needed for themselves. Some of the ships came back loaded with provisions, and bringing new recruits. For instance, the teaching of physics and mathematics almost stopped at Storsenda College because the professors had been virtually shanghaied. Khan found himself losing touch with affairs on Poitem. Ships had landed on both Janico and Horvendil and were sending back claims to abandoned factories. By that time they had all the decks into the Orborus too, and he was working aboard, getting the astrogational and hyperspace instruments put in place. The hypership Andromeda was back from the Gamma system. There was close secrecy about what the expedition had found, but the newscasts were full of conjectures about Merlin and the market went into another dizzy upward spiral. Litchfield Exploration and Salvage opened a huge munitions depot, and combat equipment, once almost unsaleable, was selling as fast as it came out. The government was buying some, but by no means all of it. "'Con, can you come back here to Poitem for a while?' his father asked. "'Things are turning serious.' I don't like to talk about it by screen, too many people know our scrambler combinations. But I wish you were here." He started to object. There were millions, well, a couple of hundred, things he had to attend to. The look on his father's face stopped him. "'Ship leaving Sickle Mountain tomorrow morning,' he said. "'I'll be aboard.' The voyage back to Poitem was a needed rest. He felt refreshed when he got off at Storsenda Spaceport and was met by his father and Wade Lucas in one of the slim recon cars. They greeted him briefly and took the car up and away from the city, where it was safe to talk. "'Con, I'm scared,' his father said. "'I'm beginning to think there really is a Merlin after all.' "'Oh, come off it!' I know it's contagious, but I thought you'd been vaccinated." "'I'm beginning to think so, too,' Lucas said. "'I don't like it at all.' "'You know what that gang who took the Andromeda to Panurge found?' "'They were looking for the plant that fabricated the elements for Merlin, weren't they?' "'Yes. They found it. My Barton Massara operatives got to some of the crew.' This place had been turning out material for a computer of absolutely unconventional design. The two computer men they had with them couldn't make head or tail of half of it. And every blueprint, every diagram, every scrap of writing or recording had been destroyed. But they found one thing, a big empty fiber folder that had fallen under something and been overlooked. It was marked, Top Secret, Project Merlin. Project Merlin could have been anything, Khan started to say. No, Project Merlin was something they made computer parts for. Dolph Kelton's research crew at the library here came across some references to Project Merlin, too. For instance, there was a routine division court-martial, a couple of second lieutenants, on a very trivial charge. Force Command ordered the court-martial stopped, and the two officers simply dropped out of the Third Force records. It was stated that they were engaged in work connected with Project Merlin. That's an example. There were a half a dozen things like that. Tell him what Kurt Fawzi and his crew found, Wade Lucas said. Yes. They have a fifty-foot shaft down from the top of the mesa, almost to the top of the underground headquarters. They found something on top of the headquarters. A disc-shaped mass fifty feet thick and a hundred across, armored in collapsium. It's directly over what used to be Fox Travis's office. That's not a tenth big enough for anything that could even resemble Merlin. Well, it's something. I was out there day before yesterday. 
they're down to the collapsium on top of this thing. I rode down the shaft in a jeep and looked at it. Look, Con, we don't know what this Project Merlin was. All this lore about Merlin that's grown up since the war is pure supposition. But Fox Travis told me, categorically, that there was no Merlin Project, Con said. The war's been over forty years. It's not a military secret any longer. Why would he lie to me? Why did you lie to Kurt Fawzi and the others and tell them there was a Merlin? You lied because telling the truth would hurt them. Maybe Travis had the same reason for lying to you. Maybe Merlin's too dangerous for anybody to be allowed to find. Great goo! Are you beginning to think Merlin is the devil or Frankenstein's monster? It might be something just as bad. Maybe worse. I don't think a man like Fox Travis would lie if he didn't have some overriding moral obligation to. And we know who's been making most of the trouble for us, too, Lucas added. Yes, Rodney Maxwell said, we do. And sometime I'm going to invite Clem Zareff to kick my pants seat. Sam Murchison, the Terran Federation Minister General. How did you get that? Barton Macera got some of it. They have an operative planted in Murchison's office. And some of our banking friends got the rest. This Human Supremacy League is being financed by somebody. Every so often, their treasurer makes a big deposit at one of the banks here, all Federation currency, big denomination notes. When I asked them to, they started keeping a record of the serial numbers and checking withdrawals. The money was paid out at the First Planetary Bank to Mr. Samuel S. Murchison in person. The Armageddonists are getting money, too, but they're too foxy to put theirs through the banks. I believe they're the ones who mind-probed Lucy Nocero. Barton Macera believe, but they can't prove, that human supremacy launched that robo-bomb at us that time at the spaceport. Have you done anything with those audio-visuals of Liebert? Gave them to Barton Macera. They haven't gotten anything yet. So we have to admit that Clem wasn't crazy after all. What do you want me to do? Go out to Force Command and take charge. We have to assume that there may be a Merlin. We have to assume that it may be dangerous. And we have to assume that Kurt Fawzi and his covey of Merlinolators are just before digging it up. Your job is to see that whatever it is doesn't get loose. The trouble was, if he started giving orders around Force Command, he'd stop being a brilliant young man and become a half-baked kid, and one word from him and the older and wiser heads would do just what they pleased. He wondered if the pro-Liebert and anti-Liebert factions were still squabbling. Maybe if he went out of his way to antagonize one side, he'd make allies of the other. He took the precaution of screening in first. Kurt Fawzi, with whom he talked, was almost incoherent with excitement. At least he was reasonably sure that none of Clem Zareff's trigger-happy mercenaries would shoot him down coming in. The well, fifty feet in diameter, went straight down from the top of the mesa. As the headquarters had been buried under loose rubble, they'd had to vitrify the sides going down. He let down into the hole in a jeep, and stood on the collapsing roof of whatever it was they had found. It wasn't the top of the headquarters itself. The micro-ray scanning showed that. It was a drum-shaped superstructure, a sort of underground penthouse. And there they were stopped. You didn't cut collapsium with a cold chisel, or even an atomic torch. He began to see how he was going to be able to take charge here. "'You haven't found any passage leading into it?' he asked, when they gathered in Fawzi's, formerly Fox Travis's, office. "'Niffelheim, no. If we had, we'd be inside now,' Tom Brangwen swore. "'And we've been all over the ceiling in here, and we can't find anything but vitrified rock and then the collapsium shielding.' "'Sure.' 
There are collapsium cutters at Port Carpenter on Koshai. They do it with cosmic rays. But collapsium will stop cosmic rays, Zeref objected. Stop them from penetrating, yes. A collapsium cutter doesn't penetrate, it abrades. It throws out a rotary beam and then works like a grinding wheel or a buzz saw. Well, could you get one down that hole? Judge Ledoux asked. He laughed. No, the thing is rather too large. In the first place, there's a full-sized power reactor and a mass-energy converter. With them, you produce negamatter atoms with negatively charged protons and positive electrons, positrons. Then you have to bring them into contact with normal positive matter. That's done in a chamber the size of a fifty-gallon barrel, made of collapsium and weighing about a hundred tons. Then you have to have a pseudograv field to impart rotary motion to your cosmic ray beam, and the generator door that would lift ten ships the size of the Lester Dawes. Then you need another fifty to a hundred tons of collapsium to shield your cutting head. The cutting head alone weighs three tons. The rotary beam that does the cutting, he mentioned as an afterthought, is about the size of a silver five centisol piece. Nobody said anything for a few seconds. Carl Liebert stated that divine power would aid them. Nobody paid much attention. Liebert's stock seemed to have gone bearish since he had found nothing in the butte, and Fawzi had found that whatever it was on top of Force Command. "'Means we're going to dig the whole blasted top off, clear down to where that thing is,' Zareff said. "'That'll take a year.' Oh, no, maybe a couple of weeks after we get started, Khan told them. It'll take longer to get the stuff loaded on a ship and hauled here than it will to get that thing uncovered and opened. He told them about the machines they used in the iron mines on Koshai, and as he talked, he stopped worrying about how he was going to take charge here. He had just been unanimously elected indispensable man. Bless you, young man, Carl Liebert cried. At last, the great computer. Those who come after will reckon this the year zero of the age of regeneration. I will go to my chamber and return thanks in prayer. He's been doing a lot of praying lately, Tom Brangwen remarked after Liebert had gone out. He's moved into the chaplain's quarters, back of the pan-denominational chapel on the fourth level down. Always keeps his door locked, too. Well, if he wants privacy for his devotions, that's his business. Maybe we could all do with a little prayer, Veltrin said. Probably praying to Sam Murchison by radio, Clem Zareff retorted. I'd like to see inside those rooms of his. He called Eve's Jackmont at Port Carpenter after dinner. When he told Jackmont what he wanted and why, the engineer remarked that it was a pity screens couldn't be fitted with olfactory sensors, so he could smell Khan's breath. I am not drunk, I am not crazy, and I am not exercising my sense of humor. I don't know what Fozzy and his gang have here, but if it isn't Merlin, it's something just as hot. We want at it soonest, and we'll have to dig a couple of hundred feet of rock off it and open a collapsium can. How are we going to get that stuff on a ship? Anything been done to that normal space job we started since I saw it last? Can you find engines for it? And is there anything about those mining machines or the cutter that would be damaged by space radiation or reentry heat? Eve's Jackmont was silent for a good deal longer than the interplanetary time lag warranted. Finally, he nodded. I get it, Con. We won't put the things in a ship. We'll build a ship around them. No, that stuff can all be hauled open to space. They use things like that at space stations and on asteroids and all sorts of places. We'll have to stop work on Ouroboros, though. Let Ouroboros wait. We are going to dig up Merlin, and then everybody is going to be rich and happy and live happily forever after. Jackmont looked at him, silent again for longer than the usual five and a half minutes. You almost said that with a straight face. After all, Jack Mott hadn't been cleared yet for the awful truth about Merlin. But, like his daughter, 
he'd been doing some guessing. I wish I knew how much of this Merlin stuff you believe. So do I, Eves. Maybe after we get this thing open, I'll know. To give himself a margin of safety, Jack Mott had estimated the arrival of the equipment at three weeks. A week later, he was on screen to report that the skeleton ship, they had christened her the Thing, and when Khan saw screen views of her he understood why, was finished and the collapsium cutter and two big mining machines were aboard. Evidently, nobody on Koshai had done a stroke of work on anything else. Sylvie's coming along with her, so are Jerry Rivas and Anse Dawes, and Ham Matsui and Gomez and Karanja, and four or five others. They'll be ready to go to work as soon as she lands and unloads, Jack Mott added. That was good. They were all his own people, unconnected with any of the Merlin hunting factions at Force Command. In case trouble started, he could rely on them. Well, dig out some shooting irons for them, he advised. They may need them here. Depending, of course, on what they found when they opened that collapsium can on top of Force Command, and how the people there reacted to it. The thing took a hundred and seventy hours to make the trip. Conditions in the small shielded living quarters and control cabin were apparently worse than on the Harriet Barn on her second trip to Koshai. Everybody at Force Command was anxious and excited. Carl Liebert kept to his quarters most of the time, as though he had to pray the ship across space. At the same time, reports of the near completion of Ouroboros II were monopolizing the newscasts, to distract public attention from what was happening at Force Command. Cargo was being collected for her. Instead of washing their feet in brandy, next year people would be drinking water. Lorenzo Minardis had emptied his warehouse of everything over a year old. So had most of the other distillers up and down the Gordon Valley. Melon and tobacco planters were talking about breaking new ground and increasing their cultivated acreage for the next year. Agricultural machinery was in demand and bringing high prices. So were stills and tobacco factory machinery. It began to look as though the Maxwell plan was really getting started. It was decided to send the hypership to Baldur on her first voyage. That was Wade Lucas's suggestion. He was going with her himself, to recruit scientific and technical graduates from his alma mater, the University of Paris on Baldur, and from the other schools there. Khan was enthusiastic about that, remembering the so-called engineers on Koshai, running around with a monkey wrench in one hand and a textbook in the other, trying to find out what they were supposed to do while they were doing it. Poitem had been living for too long on the leavings of wartime production. Too few people had bothered learning how to produce anything. The thing finally settled onto the mesa top. It looked like something from an old picture of the construction work on one of the Terran space stations in the first century. Immediately, every piece of contragravity equipment in the place converged on her. Men dangled on safety lines hundreds of feet above the ground, cutting away beams and braces with torches. The two giant mining machines, one after the other, floated free on their own contragravity and settled into place. The thing lifted, still carrying the collapsium cutting equipment, and came to rest on the brush-grown flat beyond out of the way. If Eve's jackmot had overestimated the time required to get the equipment loaded and lifted off from Koshai, Khan had been over-optimistic about the speed with which the top of the mesa could be stripped off. Digging away the rubble with which the pit had been filled, and even the solid rock around it, was easier than getting the stuff out of the way. Farm scows came in from all over, as fast as they and pilots for them could be found. The rush to get brandy and tobacco to Storsenda had caused an acute shortage of vehicles. One by one, the members of the old Fozzie's office gang came drifting in. Lorenzo Minardis, Morgan Gatworth, Lester Dawes, None of them had any skills to contribute, but they brought plenty of enthusiasm. 
Rodney Maxwell came whizzing out from Storsenda now and then to watch the progress of the work. Of all the crowd, he and Khan watched the two steel giants strip away the tableland with apprehension instead of hope. No, there was a third. Carl Liebert had stopped secluding himself in his quarters. He still talked rapturously about the miracles Merlin would work, but now and then Khan saw him when he thought he was unobserved. His face was the face of a condemned man. The Ouroboros II was finished. The whole planet saw, by screen, the ship lift out, watched from the ship the dwindling away of Koshai, and saw Poitem grow ahead of her. Twelve hours before she landed, work at Force Command stopped. Everybody was going to Storacenda. Sylvie, whose father would command her on her voyage to Baldur, Morgan Gatworth, whose son would be first officer and astrogator, everybody. Except Carl Liebert. Then I'm not going either, Clem Zeroff decided. Somebody's got to stay here and keep an eye on that snake. No, nor me, Tom Brangwen said. And if he starts praying again, I'm going to go and pray along with him. Khan stayed, too, and so did Jerry Revis and Anne Stawes. They watched the newscast of the liftout a week later. It was peaceful and harmonious. Everybody, regardless of their attitudes on Merlin, seemed agreed that this was the beginning of a new prosperity for the planet. There were speeches. The bands played Genji Gartner's body and the spaceman's hymn. And, at the last, when the officers and crew were going aboard, Khan saw his sister Flora clinging to Wade Lucas's arm. She was one of the small party who went aboard for a final farewell. When she came off, along with Sylvie, she was wiping her eyes, and Sylvie was comforting her. Seeing that made Khan feel better, even than watching the ship itself lift away from Storacenda. End of chapter 18《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《
How's mother taking things now? Flora looked distressed. She goes around wringing her hands. Honestly, I never saw anybody doing that outside a soap opera. Half the time she thinks you and father are a pair of unprincipled scoundrels, and the other half she thinks you're going to let Merlin destroy the world. I'm beginning to be afraid of something like that myself. Huh? But Merlin's just a big fake, isn't it? You are using it to make these people do something they wouldn't do for themselves, aren't you? It started that way. What do you think all this is about? he asked, gesturing toward the excavation and the two giant mining machines, digging and blasting and pounding away at the rock. Well, to keep Kurt Fozzy and that crowd happy, I suppose. It seems like an awful waste of time, though. I'm afraid it isn't. I'm afraid Merlin, or something just as bad, is down there. That's why I'm here instead of on Koshai. I want to keep people like Fozzy from doing anything foolish with it when they find it. But there can't be a Merlin. I'm afraid there is. Not the sort of a Merlin Fozzy expects to find. That thing's too small for that. But there is something down there. The question of size bothered him. That drum-shaped superstructure couldn't even hold the personnel record machine they had found here, or the computers at Storacenda Stock Exchange. It could have been an intelligence evaluator, or an enemy intentions predictor. But it seems small even for that. It would be something like a computer. That was as far as he was able to go. And it could be something completely outside the reach of his imagination. At the back of his mind, the suspicion grew that Carl Liebert knew exactly what it was. And he became more and more convinced that he had seen the self-styled preacher before. Finally, the whole top of the hundred-foot collapsium-covered structure was uncovered, and the excavation had been leveled out wide enough to accommodate all the massive paraphernalia of the collapsium cutter. They put the thing onto contragravity again and brought her down in place. The work of lifting off the reactor and the converter and the rest of it, piece by piece, began. Finally, everything was set up. A dozen and a half of them were gathered in the room that had become their meeting place, after dinner. They were all too tired to start the cutting that night, and at the same time excited and anxious. They talked in disconnected snatches, and then somebody put on one of the telecast screens. A music program was just ending. There was a brief silence. And then a commentator appeared, identifying his news service. He spoke rapidly and breathlessly, his professional gravity cracking all over. "'The hypership city of Asgard from Aton has just come into telecast range,' he began. "'We have received an exclusive interworld news service story recently brought to Aton on the Pan-Federation spaceline ship Magellanic from Terra. News of revived interest in the Third Force computer, Merlin, having reached Terra by way of Odin, Representatives of Interworld News, to which this service subscribes, interviewed retired Force General Fox Travis, now living at the advanced age of 114 on Luna. General Travis, who commanded the Third Fleet Army Force here during the war, categorically denied that there had ever existed any supercomputer of the sort. We bring you now a recorded interview with General Travis, made on Luna. For an instant, Khan felt the room around him whirling dizzily, and then he caught hold of himself. Everybody else was shouting in sudden consternation, and then everybody was hushing everybody else and making twice as much noise. The screen flickered, the commentator vanished, and instead, seated in the deep cushioned chair, was the thin and frail old man with whom Khan had talked two years before and through an open segment of dome roof behind him the full earth shone, the contents of the western hemisphere plainly distinguishable. A young woman in starchy nurse's white bent forward solicitously from beside the chair, handing him a small beaker from which he sipped some stimulant. 
He looked much as he had when Khan talked to him. But there was something missing. Oh, yes, the comparative youngster of seventy-some. Mike Shanley, my aide-de-camp on Poitem. Now he thinks he's my keeper. He wasn't in evidence, and he should be. Then Khan knew where and when he had seen the man who claimed to be a preacher named Carl Liebert. "'There is absolutely no truth in it, gentlemen,' Travis was saying. "'There never was any such computer. I only wish there had been. It would have shortened the war by years. We did, of course, use computers of all sorts, but they were all the conventional types used by business organizations.' The rest was lost in a new outburst of shouting. General Travis, in the screen, continued in dumb show. The only thing Khan could distinguish was Liebert's Shanley's voice, screaming, "'Can it be a lie? Is there no great computer?' Then Kurt Fawzi was pounding on the top of the desk and bellowing, "'Shut up! Listen!' "'Frankly, I'm surprised,' Travis was continuing. "'Young Maxwell talked to me, here, in this room, a couple of years ago. I told him then that nothing of the sort existed. If he's back on Poitem telling people there is, he's lying to them, and taking advantage of their credulity. There never was anything called Project Merlin.' "'Ha! Who's a liar now?' Clemzerov shouted. "'Dolph, what did your people find in the library?' "'Why, that's right!' Professor Kelton exclaimed. "'My students did find a dozen references to Project Merlin. He couldn't be ignorant of anything like that.' "'This youth has been lying to us all along,' the old man with the beard cried, pointing an accusing finger at Khan. "'He has created false hopes. He has given us faith in a delusion. Why, he is the wickedest monster in human history!' "'Well, thank you, General Travis,' another voice from the screen-speaker was saying, the only calm voice in the room. "'That was a most excellent statement, sir. It should—' "'Con, you didn't tell us you'd talk to General Travis,' Morgan Gatworth was saying. "'Why didn't you?' "'Because I never believed anything he told me. "'You were in Kurt Fawzi's office the day I came home.' You know how shocked everybody was when I told you I hadn't been able to learn anything positive. Why should I repeat his lies and discourage everybody that much more? Why, he'd deny there was a Merlin if he was sitting on top of it, Khan declared. He wants the credit for winning the war, not for letting Merlin win it for him. I don't blame Khan, Klemzerov said. If he'd told us that then, some of us might have believed it. "'And look what we've found,' Kurt Fawzi added, pointing at the ceiling. "'Is that Merlin up there, or isn't it?' "'That little thing!' Shanley cried scornfully. "'How could that be Merlin? I'm going to my chamber, to pray for forgiveness for this wretch!' He turned and started for the door. "'Stop him, Tom,' Khan said, and Tom Brangwen put himself in front of the older man, gripping his right arm. Shanley tried, briefly, to resist. "'Seems to me you lost faith in Merlin awfully quick,' the former town marshal of Litchfield said. "'You knew there was a Merlin all along, and you never wanted us to find it.' Franz Veltrin, who'd been Liebert's most enthusiastic adherent, had also lost faith suddenly. He was shouting vituperation at the prophet of Merlin. "'Knock it off, Franz.' He was only doing his duty, Khan said. Weren't you, General Shanley? It took almost a minute before they stopped yelling for an explanation and allowed him to make one. He caught Clem Zarif's comment. Must be pretty hot if they have to send a general to handle it. I talked to Travis, yes. He gave me the same story he just repeated on that interview, Khan said, picking his way carefully between fact and fiction. After I went back to Montevideo, he and this aide of his must have been afraid I didn't believe it, which I didn't. When I was ready to graduate, I got this offer of an instructorship. 
that was a bribe to keep me on Terra and off Poitem. When I turned it down and took the Mazar home, Travis sent Shanley after me. He must have grown that beard and that pageboy bob on the way out. I suppose he contacted Murchison as soon as he landed. Wait a minute. He went to the communications screen and punched out a combination. A girl appeared and sing-songed, Barton Massara, Investigation and Protection. Con Maxwell here. We gave you some audio-visuals of a man with a white beard, alias Carl Liebert, he began. Just a sec, Mr. Maxwell. She spoke quickly into a handphone. The screen flickered and she was replaced by a hard-faced young man in dark clothes. Hello, Mr. Maxwell, Joe Massara. We haven't found anything on Liebert yet. Are any of the officers of the Andromeda where you can contact them? Let them see those audio-visuals. I'll bet that beard was grown aboard ship coming out from Terra. Bedlam broke out suddenly. Shanley, who had been standing passively, his right arm loosely grasped by Tom Brangwen, came down on Brangwen's instep with the heel of his left foot and hit Brangwen under the chin with the heel of his left palm. Wrenching his arm free, he started for the door. Sylvie Jackmott snatched a chair and threw it along the floor. It hit the fleeing man's ankles and brought him down. Half a dozen men piled on top of him, and Brangwen was yelling to them not to choke him to death till he could answer some questions. "'Hey, what's going on?' the detective agency man in the screen was asking. "'Need help? We'll start a car right away.' "'Everything's under control, thank you.' Masara hesitated for a moment. "'What's the dope on this statement that was on telecast a few minutes ago?' he asked. "'Travis doesn't want us to find Merlin. What you just heard was one of his people, planted here at Force Command. We're going to question him when we have time. But there isn't a word of truth in that statement you just heard on the Herald Guardian newscast. Merlin exists, and we've found it. We'll have it open inside of thirty hours at most.' That was the line he was going to take with everybody. As soon as he had Masara off the screen, he was punching the combination of his father's private screen at Interplanetary Building. It took five interminable minutes before Rodney Maxwell came on. He could hear Clem Zareff shouting orders into one of the inside communication screens. General turnout, everything on combat ready, guards to come at once to the office. "'How close are you to digging that thing out?' his father asked as soon as he appeared. "'We're down to it. We can start cutting the collapsium any time now.' "'Start cutting it ten minutes ago,' his father told him. "'And don't leave Force Command till you have it open. How many men and vehicles does Clem have for defense? You'll need all of them in a couple of hours. Everybody here is stunned now. They'll come out of it inside an hour, and they'll come out fighting. You'd better come out here.' He turned, saw Jerry Rivas helping hold Shanley in a chair, and shouted to him, "'Jerry! Turn out the workmen! Start cutting the can open right away!' He turned back to his father. "'Clem's just ordered all his force out. Are you coming here?' "'I can't. In about an hour, everything's going up with a bang. I have to be here to grab a few of the pieces.' "'You'll do a lot of good in jail, or on the end of a rope.' "'Chance I have to take,' his father replied. "'I think I'll have a couple of hours. "'If anybody from the press calls you, what are you going to tell them?' Khan repeated the line he had taken already. His father nodded. "'All right. I'll call you later, if I can. "'Just keep things going at your end.' A dozen of Clem Zareff's men were crowding into the room. "'This man's under close arrest,' the old soldier was telling them. He is very important and very dangerous. Take him out somewhere, search him to the skin, take his clothes away from him and give him a robe. He's to be watched every second. Make sure he hasn't poison or other suicide means. He's to be questioned later. As soon as Rodney Maxwell was off the screen, there was a call signal. It was one of the news services, wanting a statement. I'll take it, Gatworth said, and began talking. This statement of General Travis's is completely false. 
There is a Merlin, and we've found it. They found something that might be good enough, Merlin, for the next thirty hours. That superstructure was just big enough for the manually operated parts of a computer like Merlin, the input and output, and the programming machines. Chapter 20 Clem Zareff's guardsmen were mercenaries. A little over a year ago they had, at best, been homeless drifters, and not a few had been outlaws. Now they were soldiers, well-fed, clothed, quartered, and equipped, and well and regularly paid. They had a good thing. They were willing to fight to keep it, Merlin or no Merlin. Khan left them to their commander. He did gather the workmen for a short harangue, but that wasn't really necessary. They had a good thing, too, and most of them realized that they were working toward a better thing. They could be depended upon, too. They came crowding out and manned lifters. They got the heavy collapsium cutter maneuvered into place and the shielding down around the cutting head. After that, there were only four men who could work, each in his own heavily shielded cabin. In spite of the shielding that covered the actual work, there was an awesome display of multicolored light. It was like being in the middle of an aurora borealis. What was going on where that tiny rotating beam of cosmic rays was grinding at the collapsium simply couldn't have been imagined. Khan would have liked to stay outside. He could not. Too many things were happening in too many places, and it was all coming in by screen. Rioting had broken out in Storsenda and a dozen other places. He saw, on a news screen, a mob raging in front of the executive palace. Yellow-shirted cybernarchists were battling with city police and planetary troops. Armageddonists and human supremacy leaguers were fighting both and one another. Above all the confused noise of shouting and shooting, an amplifier was braying, "'It's a lie! It's a lie! Merlin has been found!' Newsmen began arriving. Zareff's men had orders to pass them through the cordon that had been put up around Force Command, and they took up his time. It was worth it, though. They could tell him what was going on. J. Fitzwilliam Sturber called. Rodney Maxwell had been arrested, on a farrago of fraud charges. I don't know who he's supposed to have defrauded. The planetary government is the sole complainant and bail was being illegally denied. Sturber's lawyerly soul was outraged, but he was grimly elated. "'You wait till things quiet down a little. We're going to start a false arrest suit.' "'If you're alive to—' Apparently Sturber hadn't thought of that. What do you think's going to happen when the stock exchange opens?' "'It's going to be bad. But don't worry. Your father must have foreseen something like this.' He gave me instructions, and instructed a few more people. He named some of the Tri-System Investments people and some of the bankers. We're going to try and brace the market as long as we can. Nobody who keeps his head is going to lose anything in the long run." Luther Chen Wong called from Port Carpenter on Koshai. He and Clyde Nichols and a young mathematics professor named Simon McQuart had been running the colony in Khan's absence and since Eve's Jackmont had gone to space in the Ouroboros too, "'Well, they caught up with you,' he said. Evidently he had figured out what the search for Merlin was all about, too. "'What do we do about it?' "'Well, we are just before finding Merlin here. I hope we find it before things get too bad.' He told Luther the situation of the moment. "'Have you people started on another hypership yet?' We're getting organized, too. I don't suppose it's advisable to send any more ships into Storacenda for a while. Are you sure this thing you found is Merlin? I don't know what it is. It's only big enough for the apparatus they need to operate a thing like Merlin. Yes, Luther, I'm sure we have found Merlin. Chen Wang looked at him curiously. I hope so. I can't think of anything else that can stop this business." Tom Brangwen was in the room when he turned from the screen. 
We searched Liebert's Shanley's rooms, he said. We found a bomb. What kind of bomb? Vest pocket thermonuclear. He seems to have gotten the fissionables by taking apart a couple of light tactical missiles. The whole thing's packed inside a hundred-pound power cartridge case. It was in a traveling bag under his bed. And you know how it was to be fired? With a regular forty-millimeter flare pistol welded into the end of the bomb. The flare powder had been taken out of the cartridge, and it had been reloaded with a big charge of rifle powder. I suppose it would blow one subcritical mass into another, but the only way he could have fired the bomb would have been by pulling the trigger. And blowing himself up along with it. He must have wanted Merlin destroyed pretty badly. Have you questioned him yet? Not yet. I wanted to tell you about it first. He looked at his watch. Only four hours had passed since the newscast. Why, that seemed like months ago now. All right, Tom. We'll go talk to him. Where's the colonel? Zareff was surrounded by a dozen screens, keeping in touch with the Lester Dawes and the gunboats and combat cars, and the gun positions with which he had ringed force command. It was only a little army, maybe, but he was a busy commander-in-chief. You take care of it. Tell me what you get from him. I can't leave now. There's a report of a number of aircraft approaching from the west now. They found Judge Ledoux and Kurt Fawzi and Dolph Kelton, who were just sitting around wishing there was something to do to help. They gave Franz Veltrin and Sylvie Jackmott the job of keeping the representatives of the press amused. Then they went down to the room in which General Mike Shanley was held under guard. Shanley, wearing a bathrobe and nothing else, was lying on a cot, sleeping peacefully. Three of Zareff's men were sitting on chairs, watching him narrowly. "'All right, you can go,' Kahn told them. "'We'll take care of him.' Shanley woke instantly. He sat up and swung his legs over the edge of the cot. "'You can have my name and rank,' he said, and his voice no longer quavered. My serial number is, he receded a string of figures, and that's all you're getting out of me. We'll get anything we want out of you, Kahn told him. You know what a mind probe is? You should. Your accomplices used one on my father's secretary. She's a hopeless imbecile now. You'll be, too, when we're through with you. But before then, you'll have given us everything you know. Kelton began to protest. Con, you can't do a thing like that. A mind probe is utterly illegal. Why, it's a capital offense, Ledoux exclaimed. Con, I forbid you. Judge, don't make me call those guards and have you removed, Con said. You can stop bluffing, Shanley told him. Where would you get a mind probe? Out of the chief of intelligence's office here in his headquarters. I should imagine it was to be used in interrogating Alliance prisoners during the war. I think Colonel Zareff would enjoy helping to use it on you. He used to be an Alliance officer." Shanley was silent. Khan sat down in one of the chairs at the small table. "'General Shanley, would you describe General Fox Travis as a man of honor and integrity?' And would you so describe yourself?" Shanley said nothing. "'Yet both of you have lied, deliberately and repeatedly, to conceal the existence of Merlin. And we found that bomb in your room. You were willing to blow up this headquarters, and everybody, yourself included, in it, to keep us from getting at Merlin. Well, you know that we can make you tell us the truth, maybe when it's too late, and you know that we are going to get Merlin. We're cutting the collapsium off that thing above now." Shanley laughed. "'You're supposed to be a computer man. You think that little thing could be Merlin?' "'The controls and programming machine for Merlin.' He turned to Kurt Fawzi. "'You always claimed that Merlin was here in Force Command. You had it backward. Force Command is inside Merlin.' "'What do you mean, Con?' The walls, 
the fifty-foot walls, shielded inside and out? Merlin, the circuitry, the memory bank, the relays, everything, was installed inside them. What's up above is only what we needed to operate the computer. Isn't that true, General? Shanley had stopped his derisive laughter. He sat on the edge of the cot, tensing as though for a leap at Kahn's throat. That won't help, either. If you try it, we won't shoot you. We'll just overpower you and start mind-probing right away. Now, you feel that suppressing Merlin was worth any sacrifice. We're not unreasonable. If you can convince us that Merlin ought not to be brought to light, well, you can't do any harm by talking, and you may do some good. You may even accomplish your mission. He can't talk us out of it, Kurt Fawzi seemed determined to spoil things by saying. Con, I'm coming around to Clem's way of thinking. They just don't want anybody else to have it. No, we don't, Shanley said. We don't want the whole Federation breaking up into bloody anarchy. And that's what'll happen if you dig that thing up and put it into operation. Nobody said anything except Fawzi, who began an indignant contradiction and then subsided. Tom Brangwen lit a cigarette. "'Would you mind letting me have one of those?' Shanley said. "'I haven't had a smoke since I came here. It wouldn't have been in character.' Brangwen took one out of the pack, lit it at the tip of his own, and gave it to Shanley with his left hand, his right ready to strike. Shanley laughed in real amusement. "'Oh, brother!' he reproved in his former pious tones. "'You distrust your fellow man. That is a sin!' He rose slowly, the bathrobe flapping at his bare shins, and sat down across the table from Khan. All right, he said. I'll tell you about it. I'll tell you the truth, which will be something of a novelty all around. Shanley puffed for a moment at the cigarette. It must really have tasted good after his long abstinence. You know, we were really caught off balance when the war ended. It even caught Merlin short. Information lag, of course. The whole alliance caved in all at once. Well... We fed Merlin all the data available, and analyzed the situation. Then we did something we really weren't called upon to do, because that was policy planning and wasn't our province. But we were going to move an occupation army into System State's planets, and we didn't want to do anything that would embarrass the Federation government later. We fed Merlin every scrap of available information on political and economic conditions everywhere in the Federation and set up a long-term computation of the general effects of the war. The extrapolation was supposed to run five hundred years in the future. It didn't. It stopped, at a point a trifle over two hundred years from now, with a statement that no computation could be made further, because at that point the Terran Federation would no longer exist. The others, who had taken chairs facing him, looked at him blankly. "'No more Federation?' Judge Ledoux asked incredulously. "'Why, the Federation! The Federation!' "'The Federation would last forever. Anybody knew that. There just couldn't be no more Federation.' "'That's right,' Shanley said. "'We had trouble believing it, too. Remember, we were Federation officers.' The Federation was our religion, just like patriotism used to be, back in the days of nationalism. We checked for error. We made detailed analysis. We ran it all over again. It was no use. In two hundred years, there won't be any Terran Federation. The government will collapse slowly. The Space Navy will disintegrate. Planets and systems will lose touch with Terra and with one another. You know what it was like here, just before the war. It will be like that on every planet, even on Terra. Just a slow crumbling, till everything is gone. Then every planet will start sliding back, in isolation, into barbarism. Merlin predicted that? Kurt Fawzi asked, shocked. 
If Merlin said so, it had to be true. Shanley nodded. So we ran another computation. We added the data of publication of this prognosis. You know, Merlin can't predict what you or I would do under given circumstances. But Merlin can handle large group behavior with absolute accuracy. If we made public Merlin's prognosis, the end would come, but not in two centuries, but in less than one. And it wouldn't be a slow, peaceful decay. It would be a bomb-type reaction. Rebellions, overthrow of Federation authority, and then revolt and counter-revolt against planetary authority. Division along sectional or class lines on individual planets. Interplanetary wars, what we fought the Alliance to prevent. Left in ignorance of the future, people would go on trying to make do with what they had. But if they found out that the Federation was doomed, everybody would be trying to snatch what they could, and end by smashing everything. Left in ignorance, there might be a planet here and there that would keep enough of the old civilization to serve, in five or so centuries, as a nucleus for a new one. Informed in advance of the doom of the Federation, they would all go down together in the same bloody shambles, and there would be a galactic night of barbarism for no one knows how many thousand years. "'We don't want anything like that to happen,' Tom Brangwen said, in a frightened voice. "'Then pull everybody out of here and blow the place up. Merlin along with it,' Shanley said. "'No, we'll not do that,' Fawzi shouted. "'I'll shoot the man dead who tries it!' Why didn't you people blow Merlin up? Con asked. We built it. We'd worked with it. It was part of us, and we were part of it. We couldn't. Besides, there was a chance that it might survive the Federation. When a new civilization arose, it would be useful. We just sealed it. There were fewer than a hundred of us who knew about it. We all took an oath of secrecy. We spent the rest of our lives trying to suppress any mention of Merlin or the Merlin Project. You have no idea how shocked both General Travis and I were when you told us that the story was still current here on Poitem. And when we found out that you'd been getting into the records of the Third Force, I took the next ship I could, a miserable little freighter, and when I landed and found out what was happening, I contacted Murchison and scared the life out of him with stories about a secessionist conspiracy. All this Armageddonist human supremacy, Merlin as the devil stuff that's been going on, was started by Murchison. And he succeeded in scaring Vykoven with the cybernarchists, too. This computation on the future of the Federation is still in the backwork file? Con asked. Shanley nodded. We were criminally reckless, I can see that now. Let me beg, again, that you destroy the whole thing. We'll have to talk it over among ourselves, Judge Ledoux said. The five of us here cannot presume to speak for everybody. We will, of course, have to keep you confined. I hope you will understand we cannot accept your parole. Is there anything you want in the meantime? Con asked. I would like something to smoke, and some clothes," General Shanley said, and a shave and a haircut. End of chapter 20「all through the night, a shifting blaze of many-colored light rose and dimmed the stars above the mesa. They stared in awe, 
marveling at the energy that was pouring out of the converters into a tiny spot that inched its way around the collapsium shielding. It must have been visible for hundreds of miles. It was, for there was a new flood of rumors circulating in Storsenda and repeated and denied by the newscasts, now running continuously. Merlin had been found. Merlin had been blown up by government troops. Merlin was being transported to Storsenda to be installed as arbiter of the government. Merlin the monster was destroying the planet. Merlin the devil was unchained. Khan and Kurt Fawzi and Dolph Kelton and Judge Ledoux and Tom Brangwen clustered together, talking in whispers. They had told nobody yet of the interview with Shanley. "'You think it would make all that trouble?' Kelton was asking anxiously, hoping that the others would convince him that it wouldn't. "'Maybe we had better destroy it,' Judge Ledoux faltered. "'You see what it's done already. The whole planet's in anarchy. If we let this go on—' "'We can't decide anything like that, just the five of us,' Brangwen was insisting. "'We'll have to get the others together and see what they think. We have no right to make any decision like this for them.' They're no more able to make the decision than we are, Khan said. But we've got to. They have a right to know. If you decide to destroy Merlin, you'll have to decide to kill me first, Kurt Fawzi said, his voice deadly calm. You won't do it while I'm alive. But Kurt, Ledoux expostulated, you know why these people here at Storacenda are rioting? It's because they've lost hope, because they're afraid and desperate. The Terran Federation is something everybody feels they have to have, for peace and order and welfare. If people thought it was breaking up, they'd be desperate too. They'd do the same insane things these people here on this planet are doing. General Shanley was right. Don't destroy the hope that keeps them sane. We don't need to do that, Kurt Fawzi argued. We can use Merlin to solve our problems. We don't need to tell the whole Federation what's going to happen in two hundred years. It would get out. It couldn't help getting out, Ledoux said. Let's not try to decide it ourselves, Khan said. Let's get Merlin into operation and run a computation on it. "'You mean ask Merlin to tell us whether it ought to be destroyed or not?' Ledoux asked incredulously. "'Let Merlin put itself on trial and sentence itself to destruction?' "'Merlin is a computer. Computers deal only in facts. Computers are machines. They have no sense of self-preservation. If Merlin ought to be destroyed, Merlin will tell us so.' "'You willing to leave it up to Merlin, Kurt?' Tom Brangwen asked. Fawzi gulped. "'Yes. If Merlin says we ought to, we'll have to do it.' Toward noon, a telecast went out from Koshai on a dozen different wavelengths. Khan, half asleep in a chair in the Commander-in-Chief's office, saw Simon McQuart, the young mathematics professor from Storsenda College, who had become one of the leaders of the colony, appear on the screen. The next moment he was fully awake, shocked by McQuart's words. This is not a threat. This is a solemn, even a prayerful warning. We do not want to use genocidal weapons of mass destruction against the world of our birth. But whether we do or not rests solely with you. We came here with a dream of a better world, a world of happiness and plenty for all. We have been working, on Koshai, to build such a world on Poitem. Now you are smashing that dream. When it is gone, we will have nothing to live for except revenge, and we will take that revenge, make no mistake. We have the weapons with which to take it. Remember, this was a Federation naval base and naval arsenal during the war. Here the Federation Navy built their super-missiles, the missiles which devastated Ashmadai and Belphegor and Baphomet, and hundreds of these weapons are here. We have them, ready for launching. Once they are launched, with the robo-pilots set for targets on Poitem, 
you will have a hundred and sixty hours, at the most, to live. We will launch them immediately, if there is another attack made upon Force Command Duplicate HQ, or upon Interplanetary Building in Storsenda, or if Rodney Maxwell is killed, no matter by whom, or under what circumstances. We beg you, earnestly and prayerfully, not to force us to do this dreadful thing. We speak to each one of you, for each one of you holds the fate of the planet in his own hands." The image faded from the screen. As it did, Khan was looking from one to another of the people in the room with him. All were dumbfounded, most of them frightened. "'They wouldn't do it, would they?' Lorenzo Minardis was asking. "'Khan, you know these people. They wouldn't, really.' "'Don't depend on it, Lorenzo,' Clem Zarev said. "'It's hard for a lot of people to shoot somebody ten feet away with a pistol. But just sending off a missile, that's nothing but setting a lot of dials and then pushing a button.' "'I'm not worrying about whether they do it or not,' Khan said. "'What I'm worrying about is how many people will believe they will.' Apparently a good many people did. Zarev's combat vehicles began reporting a cessation of fighting. The newscasts, repeating the ultimatum from Koshai, told of fewer and fewer disorders in the city or elsewhere. By mid-afternoon, the rioting had stopped. By that time, too, Rodney Maxwell was on screen. He was, Khan noticed, wearing his pistols again. "'What happened?' he asked. "'They let you out on bail?' Maxwell shook his head. Charges dismissed. They didn't have anything to charge me with in the first place. But they haven't let me out yet. You're wearing your guns. Yes, but they still have me penned up here at the Executive Palace. They're practically keeping me in the safe. I wish our people on Koshai hadn't mentioned me in their ultimatum. Jake Feikhoven's afraid to let me run around loose for fear some lunatic shoots me and starts the planet busters coming in. Jake did one good thing, though. He ordered the stock exchange closed and declared a five-day bank holiday. By that time, you ought to have Merlin opened and working, and then the market'll be safe. Khan simply replied, I hope so. There was no telling what kind of taps there might be on the screen his father was using. He couldn't risk telling him about Shanley, or about the last computation which Merlin made. "'If we sent the Lester Dawes in, do you think you might talk them into letting you come out here?' "'I can try.' Flora arrived at Force Command that afternoon. "'I would have come sooner,' she said, "'but Mother's had a complete collapse. It happened last evening. She's in the hospital. I was with her until just an hour and a half ago.' She's still unconscious. You mean she's in danger? I don't know. They think she's all right, except for the shock. It was the Travis statement that did it. Think I ought to go to her? Flora shook her head. Just keep on with what you're doing here. There isn't anything you can do for her now. The best thing you can do for her, Con, is prove that you weren't lying about Merlin, Sylvie told him. The Lester Dawes didn't make it from Force Command to Storsenda and back until after dark, and the green and white and red and orange lights were rising in folds and waves. Rodney Maxwell had heard about his wife's condition. It was the first thing he spoke of when Khan and Flora and Sylvie met him as he got off the ship. "'There isn't anything we can do, Father,' Flora said. "'They'll call us when there's any change.' He said the same thing Sylvie had said. The only thing we can do is get that infernal thing uncovered. Once we do this, everything will be all right. We'll show your mother that it wasn't a fake and it isn't anything dangerous. We'll put a stop to all these horror stories about mechanical devils and living machines." Khan drew his father off where the girls couldn't overhear. "'This is something worse,' he said. "'This is a bomb that could blow up the whole Federation. "'Are you going nuts, too?' his father demanded. Khan told him about Shanley. He repeated, almost word for word, the story Shanley had told. "'Do you believe that?' his father asked. 
Don't you? You were in Storcenda when the Travis statement came out. You saw how people reacted. If this story gets out, people will be acting the same way on every planet in the Federation. Not just places like Poitem, planets like Terra and Baldur and Marduk and Odin and Osiris. It would be the end of everything civilized, everywhere. Why didn't they use Merlin to save the Federation? It's past saving. It's been past saving since before the war. The war was what gave it the final shove. If they could have used Merlin to reverse the process, they wouldn't have sealed it away. But you know, Khan, we can't destroy Merlin. If we did, the same people who went crazy over the Travis statement would go crazy all over again, worse than ever. We'd be destroying everything we planned for, and we'd be destroying ourselves. That bluff young McQuart and Luther Chen Wong and Bill Nichols made wouldn't work twice. And if they weren't bluffing... His father shuddered. And if we don't, how long do you think civilization will last here, if it blows up all over the rest of the Federation? The big machine cut on, a little spot of raw energy grinding away the collapsium, inch by inch, the undulating curtains of colored light illuminated the Badlands for miles around. Then, when the first hint of dawn came into the east, they went out. The steady roar of the generators that had battered every ear for over twenty-four hours stopped. There was unbelieving silence, and then shouts. The workmen swarmed out to man lifters. Slowly, the heavy apparatus, the reactor and the converters, the cutting machine and the shielding around it was lifted away. Finally, a lone lifter came in, and men in radiation suits went down to hook on grapples, and it lifted away, carrying with it a ten-foot square sheet of thin steel that weighed almost thirty tons. When they had battered a hole in the vitrified rock underneath, guards brought up General Shanley. Somebody, almost up to professional standards, had given him a haircut. The beard was gone, too. A Federation Army officer's uniform had been found reasonably close to his size, and somebody had even provided him with the four stars of his retirement rank. He was, again, the man Khan had seen in the dome house on Luna. "'Well, you got it open,' he said, climbing down from the air jeep that had brought him. "'Now, what are you going to do with it?' "'We can't make up our minds,' Khan said. "'We're going to let the computer tell us what to do with it.' Shanley looked at him, startled. "'You mean, you're going to have Merlin judge itself and decide its own fate?' he asked. "'You'll get the same result we did.' They let a ladder down the hole and descended. Khan and his father... Kurt Fawzi, Jerry Rivas, then Shanley and his two guards, then others, until a score of them were crowded in the room at the bottom, their flashlights illuminating the circular chamber, revealing ceiling-high metal cabinets, banks of button and dial-studded control panels, big keyboards. It was Shanley who found the lights and put them on. "'Powered from the central plant down below,' he said. The main cables are disguised as the grounding outlet. If this thing had been on when you put on the power, you'd have had an awful lot of power going nowhere, apparently." Rodney Maxwell was disappointed. "'I know this stuff looks awfully complex, but I'd have expected there to be more of it.' "'Oh, I didn't get a chance to tell you about that. This is only the operating end,' Khan said. And then asked Shanley if there were inspection screens. When Shanley indicated them, he began putting them on. This is the real computer. They all gave the same view, with minor differences, long corridors ten feet wide, between solid banks of steel cabinets on either side. Khan explained where they were, and added, Kurt and the rest of them were sitting here all this time wondering where Merlin was. It was all around them. "'Well, how did you get up here?' Fawzi asked. "'We couldn't find anything from below.' "'No, you couldn't,' Shanley was amused. "'Watch this.' 
It was so simple that nobody had ever guessed it. Below, back of the Commander-in-Chief's office, there was a closet, fifteen feet by twenty. They had found it empty, except for some bits of discarded office gear, and had used it as a catch-all for everything they wanted out of the way. Shanley went to where four thick steel columns rose from floor to ceiling in a rectangle around a heavy-duty lifter, pressing a button on a control box on one of them. The lifter, and the floor under it, rose, with a thick mass of vitrified rock underneath. The closet, full of the junk that had been thrown into it, followed. "'That's it,' he said. "'We just tore out the controls inside that and patched it up a little. There's a sheet of collapsium plate under the floor. Your scanner simply couldn't detect anything from below.' Confident that Merlin would decree its own destruction, Shanley gave his parole. The others accepted it. The newsmen were admitted to the circular operating room and encouraged to send out views and descriptions of everything. Then the lift controls were reinstalled, the lid was put back on top, and the only access to the room was through the office below. The entrance to this was always guarded by Zareff's soldiers or Brangwen's police. There were only a score of them who could be led in on the actual facts. For the most part, they were the same men who had been in Fawzi's office on the afternoon of Khan's return, a year and a half ago. A few others, Anse Dawes, Jerry Rebus, and five computer men Khan had trained on Koshai had to be trusted. Khan insisted on letting Sylvie Jackmont in on the revised, awful truth about Merlin. They spent a lot of their time together, in Travis's office, for the most part sunk in dejection. They had finally found Merlin. Now they must lose it. They were trying to reconcile themselves and take comfort from the achievement, empty as it was. They could see no way out. If Merlin said that Merlin had to be destroyed, that was it. Merlin was infallible. Khan hated the thought of destroying that machine with his whole being, not because it was an infallible oracle, but because it was the climactic masterpiece of the science he had spent years studying. To destroy it was an even worse sacrilege to him than it was to the Merlinolators. And Rodney Maxwell was thinking of the public effects. What the Travis statement had started would be nothing by comparison. You know... We can keep the destruction of Merlin a secret, Khan said. It'll take some work down at the power plant, but we can overload all the circuits and burn everything out at once. He turned to Shanley. I don't know why you people didn't think of that. Shanley looked at him in surprise. Why, now that you mention it, neither do I, he admitted. We just didn't. Then, Khan continued, we can tinker up something in the operating room that'll turn out what will look like computation results. As far as anybody outside ourselves will know, Merlin will still be solving everybody's problems. We'll do like any fortune teller, tell the customer what he wants to believe and keep him happy. More lies. Lies without end. And now he'd have a machine to do his lying for him a dummy computer that wouldn't compute anything. And all he'd wanted, to begin with, had been a ship to haul some brandy to where they could get a fair price for it. Peace had returned. At first it had been a frightened and uneasy peace. The bluff, he hoped that was what it had been, by the Koshai colonists, had shocked everybody into momentary inaction. In the twenty-four hours that had followed, the forces of sanity and order had gotten control again. Merlin existed and had been found. As for Travis's statement, the old general had been bound by a wartime oath of secrecy to deny Merlin's existence. The majority relaxed, ashamed of their hysterical reaction. As for the cybernarchists and Armageddonists and human supremacy leaguers, the government and private police— vastly augmented by volunteers, speedily rounded up the leaders, their followers dispersed, 
realizing that Merlin was nothing but a lot of dials and buttons, and interestedly watching the broadcast views of it. The banks were still closed, but discreet backdoor withdrawals were permitted to keep business going. So was the stock exchange, but word was going around the brokerage offices that Tri-System Investments was in the market for a long list of securities. Nobody was willing to do anything that might upset the precarious balance. Everybody was talking about the bright future, when Merlin would guide Portem to even greater and more splendid prosperity. Khan's father and sister flew to Litchfield. Flora stayed with her mother, and Rodney Maxwell returned to Force Command, shaking his head gravely. "'She's still unconscious, Khan,' he said. "'She just lies there, barely breathing. The doctors don't know. I wish Wade hadn't gone on the ship.' The price of what he had wanted to do was becoming unendurably high for Khan. They ran off the computations Merlin had made forty years before and rechecked them. There had been no error. The Terran Federation, overextended, had been cracking for a century before the war. The strain of that conflict had started an irreversible breakup. Two centuries for the Federation as such. At most, another century of irregular trade and occasional war between independent planets galaxy full of human-populated planets as poor as Poitem at its worst. Or, aware of the future, sudden outbursts of desperate violence, then anarchy and barbarism. It took a long time to set up the new computation. Forty years of history for almost five hundred planets had to be abstracted and summarized, and translated from verbal symbols to the electromathematical language of computers and fed in. Khan and Sylvie and General Shanley and the three men and two women Khan had taught on Koshai worked and rested briefly and worked again. Finally, it was finished. General, you're the oldest Merlin hand, Khan said, gesturing to the red button at the main control panel. You do it. You do it, Khan. None of us would be here except for you. Thank you, General. He pressed the button. They all stood silently watching the output slot. Even a positronic computer does not work instantaneously. Nothing does. Khan took his eyes from the slot from which the tape would come and watched the second hand of the clock above it. The wait didn't seem like hours to him, it only seemed like seventy-five seconds that way. Then the bell rang and the tape began coming out. It took another hour and a half of button-punching. The Braille-like symbols on the tape had to be retranslated, and even Merlin couldn't do that for itself. Merlin didn't think in human terms. It was the same as before. In ignorance, the peoples of the Federation worlds would go on, striving to keep things running until they wore out, and then sinking into apathetic acceptance. Deprived of hope, they would turn to frantic violence and smash everything they most wanted to preserve. Khan pushed another button. The second information request went in. What is the best course to be followed under these conditions by the people of Poitem? It had taken some time to phrase that in symbols a computer would find comprehensible. The answer, at great length, emerged in two minutes, eight seconds. Retranslating it took five hours. In the beginning, and for the first ten years, it was, almost item for item, the Maxwell Plan. Export trade, specialized in luxury goods, brandies and wines, tobacco a long list of other exportable commodities and optimum markets, reopening of industrial plants, establishment of new industries, attainment of economic self-sufficiency, cultural self-sufficiency, establishment of universities, institutes of technology, research laboratories. Then the Maxwell Plan became the Merlin Plan. 
The breakup of the Federation was a fact that entered into the computation. Build-up of military strength to resist aggression by other planetary governments. Defense of the Gartner Tri-System. Lists of possible aggressor planets. Revival of interstellar communications and trade. Expeditions. Conquest and re-education of natives. We can't begin to handle this without Merlin, Khan said. If that means blowing up the Federation, let it blow. We'll start a new one here. No, if there's a general, violent collapse of the Federation, it'll spread to Poitem, Shanley told him. Let's ask Merlin the big question. Merlin took a good five minutes to work that one out. The question had to include a full description of Merlin, and a statement of the information which must be kept secret. The answer was even more lengthy, but it was summed up in the first word. Falsification. "'So Merlin's got to be a liar, too, along with the rest of us?' Sylvie cried. "'Con, you've corrupted his morals!' The rest of it was false data which must be taped in, and lists of corrections which must be made in evaluating any computation into which such data might enter. There was also a statement that, after fifty years, suppression of the truth and circulation of falsely optimistic statements about the Federation would no longer have any importance. "'Well, that's it,' Kahn said. Merlin thought himself out of a death sentence.' They crowded into the lift and went down to the office below. Everybody who knew what had been going on upstairs was there. Most of them were nursing drinks. Almost everybody was smoking. All of them were silent, until Judge Ledoux took his cigar from his mouth. "'Has the jury reached a verdict?' he asked, clinging with courtroom formality to his self-control. "'Yes, Your Honor.' We find the defendant, Merlin, not guilty as charged. In the uproar his words released, Rodney Maxwell got to his feet and came quickly to Con. Flora called just a while ago. Your mother is conscious. She's asking for us. Flora says she seems perfectly normal. We'll go right away. Take a recon car. General, will you explain things till I get back? Sylvie, do you want to come with us? Chapter 22 It was autumn again, the second autumn since he had landed from the city of Asgard at Storsunda and taken the Countess Dorothy home to Litchfield. Again the fields were bare and brown, all up and down the Gordon Valley the melons were harvested and the wine-pressing was ready to start. The house was crowded today. All top-level Litchfield seemed to have turned out, and there were guests from Storsunda and even a few who had made the trip from Koshai to be there. Simon McQuart, the president of Koshai Tech. Khan could always remember him in the screen, threatening a whole planet with devastation. Luther Chen Wong, the chief executive of Koshai Colony. Clyde Nichols, the president of Koshai Airlines. He almost bumped into Eve's Jackmont, coming in from the hall. Jackmont's beard had been trimmed down to a small imperial, and he was wearing the uniform of Tri-System and Interstellar Space Lines. Nothing at all like a Federation Space Navy uniform. He was laughing about something. He threw an arm over Khan's shoulder, and they went into the front parlor together. "'Oh, Gehenna of a big crop,' he heard Clem Zarif's voice chuckling happily above the babble in the room. "'You wouldn't believe it. Why, we had to build six new vats!' The thin-faced, white-haired man in the chair beside him said something. Mike Shanley and Clem Zarif, old enemies, were now fast friends. Shanley had come in from Force Command with Khan that morning. He had stayed on Poitem as nominal head of Project Merlin, and intended to remain there for the rest of his life. "'Oh, there aren't any more farm tramps,' Zarif replied. "'Everybody's getting factory jobs off-planet.' I have an awful time getting help, and what I can get won't work for less than ten sols a day. Why, they're even organizing a union. There were feminine shrieks from across the room, and a stampede. The house-cleaning robot had come in, 
running its vacuum-cleaning hose around and brandishing its mops. He saw his mother break away from a group of older ladies and shout, Oscar! The robot stopped dead. Yeshem, a voice came out of it, Sheshan accented. Get out, his mother commanded. Go to the kitchen. Stay there. Yeshem, the robot floated out the door to the hall. His mother rejoined her friends, probably telling them, for the thousandth time, that her boy Khan fixed up the sound receptors and voice for Oscar, or harping on how Khan had been telling everybody the truth all along, and people wouldn't believe him. Sylvie came up to him and caught his arm. "'Come on, Khan. They're going to start the rehearsal,' she said. "'They've been going to start it for an hour,' her father told her. "'Well, they're really going to start it now.' "'All right. You two run along,' Eves Jackmont said. "'And you'd better start rehearsing for your own wedding before long. The Genji will be ready to hype her out in another month, and I don't want to be at space when my only daughter gets married.' They pushed through the crowd, dragging Khan's mother with them toward the big living room beyond. On the way, Mrs. Maxwell stopped to try to drag Judge Ledoux out of a chair. "'Judge, the rehearsal is starting. They can't do it without you.' Ledoux clung to his chair. "'They daren't do it with me, Mrs. Maxwell. If I get into it, it won't be a rehearsal. They'll be really married, and then there won't be any point in having a wedding tomorrow.' Oh, Morgan, Khan called across the room to Gatworth, you've just been appointed temporary judge for the wedding rehearsal. There was a big crowd around Wade Lucas in the next room. He was telling them about the voyage to Baldur, from which he had returned, and the one to Ermansul with a cargo of arms, machine tools, and contragravity vehicles on which he and his bride would go for their honeymoon. There was another crowd around Flora. She was telling them about the new fashions on Baldur, which had been brought back on the Ouroboros too. "'Where's your father?' his mother was asking him. "'He has to rehearse giving the bride away.' "'Probably in his office. I'll go get him.' "'You'll get into an argument with somebody and forget to come back,' his mother said. "'Sylvie, you go with him and bring both of them back.' "'When'll we have our wedding, Sylvie?' he asked as they went off together. Well, before Dad goes to Aditya with the Genji, that'll have to be in a month. Two weeks? That ought to be plenty of time to get ready and let people recover from this one. Everybody's here now. Let's make it a double wedding tomorrow, she suggested. He hadn't been prepared for that. Well, I hadn't expected... Sure. Good idea, he agreed. There was a crowd in Rodney Maxwell's little office. Fawzi and some others, and some Storsenda people. One of the latter was vociferating. Jake Vykoven's no good, and he never was any good. Well, you have to admit, if he hadn't ordered the banks and the stock exchange closed that time, we'd have had a horrible panic. Admit nothing of the kind. Jethro, you were there, and you'll bear me out. About a dozen of us were at Executive Palace for hours, bullying him into that. Why, we almost had to twist one of his arms while he was signing the order with the other. And now he has the gall to run for re-election on the strength of his heroic actions at the time of the Travis hoax? I know who we went for president, another store sender man exclaimed. He's right here in this room. Yes, Rodney Maxwell almost bellowed before the other man could say anything else. Here he is. He grabbed Kurt Fawzi by the arm and yanked him to his feet. "'Here's the man most responsible for finding Merlin, the man who first suggested sending my son Khan to Terra to school, the man who, more than anyone else, devoted his life to the search for Merlin, the man whose inextinguishable faith and indomitable courage kept that search alive through its darkest hours. Everybody, get a drink. A toast to our next president.' Kurt Fawzi. Khan was sure he heard his father add, Goo, what a narrow escape. Then he and Sylvie began chanting in unison, We want Fawzi! We want Fawzi! End of The Cosmic Computer by H. Beam Piper 
Read by Mark Nelson. This has been a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org.